بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم آه الحضور الكريم آه السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته آه أهلا ومرحبا بكم في الندوة التفاعلية تحت عنوان التحديات التي تواجه النباتات البرية والنظم البيئية في شبه الجزيرة العربية والإجراءات الفورية اللازمة إحياء مجموعة المتخصصين في أنواع النباتات العربية هذه الندوة هي ندوة تفاعلية تنظمها حديقة القرآن النباتية عضو مؤسسة قطر للتربية والعلوم وتنمية المجتمع بالتعاون مع مجموعة المتخصصين في أنواع النباتات العربية الندوة باللغة الإنجليزية ويمكن اختيار الترجمة للغة العربية بالضغط على علامة الكرة الأرضية التي موجودة في أسفل تطبيق زوم ثم اختيار كلمة فرنش آآ آآ سوف ننتقل الآن للحديث باللغة الإنجليزية ومن ثم للاستماع إلى الترجمة يمكنكم الانتقال إلى زر interpretation واختيار اللغة الفرنسية أو فرنش عندها تسمعون للغة العربية إن شاء الله لعدم وجود اللغة العربية في التطبيق. We'll talk in English now. Uh, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Welcome everybody uh, to the Quranic Botanic Garden webinar on the, uh, the challenges facing the flora and ecosystem of the Arabian Peninsula and the immediate actions required. Uh, the revival of the Arabian Plant Specialist Group, Arabian Plant Species Specialist Group, ABSG. Uh, this webinar is organized by the Quranic Botanic Garden, member of Qatar Foundation for Education, Science and Community Development, in collaboration with the Arabian Plant Specialist Group and SSC Special Survival Committee, uh, West Asia. Uh, the Quranic Botanic Garden focuses on highlighting sustainable conservation and the community engagement through its webinars, uh, series that provides a platform for experts uh, and stakeholders and community to have attractive con con conversation and share experiences between people. The aim of this webinar to introduce the Arabian plant species specialist group and engage botanists to share knowledge, collaborate and deliver uh, conservation regionally. The webinar will include a series of presentations uh, highlighting case studies of projects addressing the global strategy for plant conservation 2020 objectives. Uh, let's welcome our speakers today. We have uh, a great and um, valuable speakers today from uh, every part in the world. Mrs. Fatima Khalifi, Director of the Quranic Botanic Garden. Um, Dr. John Paul Rodriguez, Chair, ICN and Species Survival Commission. Dr. Dumitella, uh, uh, Dumitella Ra uh, Ramindo, Deputy Chair, ICN and Species Survival Commission. Uh, Dr. Ihab Eid, Vice Chair, ISO and Species Survival Commission, West Asia. Uh, Dr. Thuraya Saeed, Chairperson, Arabian Plant Species Specialist Group. Dr. Tony Miller, Vice Chairperson uh, of the Arabian Plant Specialist Group, uh, Royal Botanic Garden, Edinburgh. Uh, Dr. Hatim Taifur, Botanist at the Royal Botanic Garden of Jordan. Dr. Ali Hussein al uh, Plant Specialist Resources Expert, Oman Animal and Plant Genetic Resources Center. Uh, Dr. Shahina Ghadamfar, Honorary Research Associate and the Editor of the Floor of Iraq, Royal Botanic Garden Q. Dr. Sophie Neal, Head of the Center for the Mid Middle Eastern Plants, CEMP, Royal Botanic Garden, Edinburgh. Dr. Sayyid Muhammad Al Azazi, Plant Genetic Resource Expert, Department of Agriculture, Research Ministry of Municipality and Environment, Qatar, and myself, Ahmed uh, Al Gharib, Assistant Researcher at the Quranic Botanic Garden and Vice Chair of the Arabian Plant Specialist Group. Uh, we will start our presentation now, and let's welcome Mrs. Fatima Al Khulayfi to talk about the Quranic Botanic Garden leadership in the conservation in the region. And we'll start with Ms. Fatma. Please go ahead. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa My presentation is clear. Yes, you are. You are in. Assalamu alaikum. 
First, I would like to welcome my uh, colleagues, the contributors in this webinar. Uh, it's really pleasing that the Quranic Botanic Garden became a platform attracting these reputed experts to uh, exchange knowledge. Uh, this gathering, in my uh, point of view, indicates to the mutual goals of all of us in the conservation of uh, the common plant species. I look forward to collaborate uh, to facilitate the challenges facing uh, these species survival in the region uh, uh, that we all, all, all work on. Um, in my talk, I will go through the uh, certain areas that uh, are related to the Quranic Botanic Garden, and uh, I will highlight its uh, conservational role. Um, the Quranic Botanic Garden concern mainly about the plant species that are mentioned by names in the Holy Quran and Hadith, which they are essentially from three geogra geographical zones, Mediterranean, tropical, and desert. However, the word plant that, uh, that appears in the Quran covers the whole existing plant species in the world and those after life. In this webinar, I specifically refer to the species that exist in the west of uh, Arabia, Arabian Peninsula zone for both the flora of that area as well the imported species, maybe by trading, uh, that being planted and settled in there, in addition to the uh, flora of Qatar. Uh, the, there are more than 20 species from uh, Quranic Botanic Garden uh, plant, uh, plants are growing naturally in these two areas, uh, west and east of the uh, Arabian Peninsula. For example, uh, Silvadora persica, Sinna italica, Acacia tortillis, and uh, more other uh, species. Some of the desert plant species uh, are used as uh, well as other important species as a medicine and cosmetic, such as uh, Chilicostus speciesus. This is a, a medicinal plant. Uh, Terephisa, uh, Citralis colocynthus. All of those are uh, example for medicinal and. Um, uh, Lausonia inermis, both as a medicinal and cosmetic. Uh, uh, Dryobelanopis aromatica and uh, Crocus sativus, those as a cosmetic. Uh, actually, I was going, uh, I planned to mention uh, Malotus philippinus, red uh, kamala, uh, which we uh, uh, call it in Arabic, alwars. But uh, I will keep this for uh, Dr. Shahina Ghalvanthar, as she said, she's going to talk about this. Um, I would like to highlight something here, that this kind of challenges that botanists uh, are facing to, uh, to uh, identify the plants with uh, its local Arabian names and then with the scientific name. Uh, anyway, uh, these plants are uh, significant to the Arabian tradition. Therefore, the Quranic Botanic Garden collects more than 100 tradition, uh, uh, traditional items in its botanical uh, museum. For example, uh, the mangrove, it's an important species uh, in the east of uh, Arabian Peninsula. Traditionally, it has been used uh, uh, to build the roof of the houses. Of course, it's beside, beside its uh, role in mitigation the carbon dioxide. Uh, Juniperus porosera uh, is an important uh, uh, kind of uh, species uh, that have been used to build the doors. Uh, also, straw mat from the dead palm tree is another item used traditionally beside more other uh, objects that we have it in the uh, uh, museum. Uh, the Quranic Botanic Garden issued about 11 publications 
targeted uh, all children, adults, scientists. Uh, uh, the Conservational Center of the Quranic Botanic Garden, the X2 Conservation, actually, it consists of uh, three units. Uh, the Botanical Museum, where we managed to uh, document over 100 objects and tools, as well as a permanent showroom and uh, seed bank and herbarium unit where we accomplished 1600 herbarium uh, uh, um, uh, specimens and 180 seeds replica. Also 2000 saplings uh, propagate, uh, propagated in five germination rooms. Uh, sorry, one more thing. Uh, the last unit is the nursery and uh, propagation unit unit. We have uh, over 10,000 uh, trees and we secured uh, 80 plant species from uh, what Quran Botanic Garden is concerned about. Uh, before the last slide, uh, I would like to, uh, to talk about the conservation uh, project that we have. Recently, we are working on two different in situ conservation projects. Uh, uh, the restoration project, uh, we are working on uh, propagating 6,000 saplings for, uh, from, uh, uh, sorry, for six um, uh, species, different species, to restore to robot the microhabitat. And this helps to uh, reduce the carbon dioxide beside uh, completing the uh, desertification. Uh, the other important project is uh, habitats assessment and uh, floristic survey. Uh, we managed to collect database of flowering and uh, uh, fruiting seasons in around 10 Rauda in microhabitat. As we're looking uh, forward to uh, work on the IUCN Red List uh, assessment. Uh, in the end, I would uh, men mention the challenges, um, which is the red listing. Uh, uh, I can say that the uh, we don't have still, we don't have the, the list of the threatened spe uh, species. Uh, we also don't have the green uh, list for the, uh, uh, for the species and the protected area. Also the land degradation and the desertification is one of the challenges, as well as the genus identification problems, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, the good uh, things, opportunities that we have uh, perfect work in assessment and the floristic surveys. Uh, we also have a good job in restoration projects. Uh, also collaborate with uh, experts like you is a, an opportunity for us. Uh, uh, this, like this, I have finished my presentation. And thank you for listening. And uh, the mic with you, Ahmed. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ms. Fatima, so much. Uh, for this uh, brief uh, presentation for the uh, the work of the Quran Botanic Garden. Actually, uh, this for the, your, your topic or your presentation, you mentioned the challenges uh, facing and one, one of the challenges is uh, the taxonomic problems or the genes problems that you mentioned and this is what we'll, we'll discuss today. Also, you mentioned the traditions and this work of the Quran Botanic Garden, this is one of the uh, main scope of the Arabian Blessed Specialist Group as well restoration program and the IUCN, it's uh, all, all of this, the, the activity that you are, you mentioned in this, in your presentation, it will be the main topics for other speakers today in order to solve all of this problem. And from this webinar, we can start in order to solve this problem very easy with our experts today. So now we will move direct to Dr. Jung, uh, Paul Rodriguez, to, to talk to us about the, uh, Species Survival Committee Commission and the priority for the plant conservation in UCC aims and its variation. And uh, Dr. Uh, Domitella as well will join uh, Dr. Uh, John, and then uh, Dr. Rahab Eid will be the, thir the third speaker for the same presentation. So uh, welcome Dr. John Borrelius to talk to us about the Species Survival Commission. So my clear Jones. Hello, thank you. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure and honor to be here. As you said, this presentation is in three parts. I will do a general introduction 
to the SSC and then to Matilda, and they have to follow. And thank you, Ahab, for, for putting this together and all the work you have done uh, reactivate, uh, reviving, like you say, the radio plants, especially the speaker. So when we talk about IUCN, uh, a, a question that always comes up is, you know, what is IUCN and who does the IUCN unite? You know, it's an international union for conservation of nature, but who is united by IUCN? Well, the, the principal, uh, the owners, the top highest authority of IUCN is the General Assembly, which is here, up here at the top, which is made up of the members of IUCN. The members of IUCN are organizations in government, in civil society, indigenous peoples and affiliates, and there are about 1,500, 1,498 uh, last night uh, in our database from 168 countries. The other two groups of, of uh, participants, we call the three pillars of UCN. One of them is the commissions, the other one is the members, and the third is the secretariat. The commissions is what is the, is the body of IUCN that Domitila and I represent. She is the deputy chair and I am the chair of this. Um, the General Assembly meets every four years and every four years elects the chairs of the commission, the president, the treasurer, different authorities within IUCN, and it approves resolutions as well as the commission mandates. So the General Assembly, uh, which usually meets during the World Conservation Congress, was supposed to meet this year in June in Marseille in France, but due to the corona uh, epidemic, it is now postponed to January. So this is a very, very general picture for what the UCN is like. Now, well, it, the interesting things about UCN, there are many interesting things, but some are here on the slide. It's 70 years old, but it's the only organization in the world of conservation organizations that brings together governments and civil society. And that's very interesting because if you go to the World Conservation Congress and the General Assembly, you will see, you know, large governments, large government delegations sitting next to small uh, local NGOs, uh, pretty much with the same importance, relatively speaking. So it's a very democratic and participatory forum. Very interesting. The UCN is the only organization that has observer and consultant, the only environmental organization, sorry, that sits at the United Nations. Assembly. And it is, it has become over the years, uh, kind of the global reference uh, about conservation and the status of species and ecosystems. The Peace Commission is one of the six commissions of IUCN, and we, we seek our vision for the commission is a just world that values and conserves nature through positive action to reduce the loss of diversity of life on Earth. So our work is all aimed at, uh, at uh, recovering biodiversity and restoring the species that we use. What kinds of things do we do at the SSC? Well, we, we, we support societies to conserve biodiversity. We influence their decisions and we encourage them to do it. We do that by building knowledge on the threats and status of species, and we'll talk about that in a second, by providing advice. We create a series of documents that become policies and guidelines that allow people uh, to think about the way they implement these policies nationally. We are very interested in taking the information from the threats and turning them into conservation planning. And ultimately, the most important of our goals is to catalyze conservation action. Because what we aim to do in the end is to reverse the trends of species decline. Uh, you will see that we have a large, a lot of work to do in West Asia. <laughs> it is of, of the eight uh, statutory regions of IUCN, the one with fewer members. So I think uh, I was especially pleased to hear from Ahab that he was interested in promoting the establishment of this new group because the region of the world where you are at, it is certainly a region that we have to work on and increase our membership and our work. So it's fantastic to see this uh, initiative arising from the region, and hopefully it will be uh, of interest to other experts and other taxonomic groups as well. We have approximately, at the moment, almost 10,000 members in 174 countries. I always joke that we have about you know, 20 countries or so more to conquer the world, 
We're very close to having members in almost every country in the world, and that is something that is uh, of great pride and, and interest to us. And uh, <clears throat> the SSC is composed by people from all kinds of different disciplines and experiences. Uh, scientists, of course, tend to be our, our primary membership, but we also have people working in government, others who are practitioners of conservation, a lot of zoo botanical gardens and aquarium um, engagement in the last few years, people who work in protecting areas, and experts in the different taxonomic groups uh, that you can see there below, which is just a sample of the, of the work that we do. The SOC network is, uh, has 164 groups at the moment. Those logos there are not for you to see them carefully, but just to uh, get a flavor of the diversity within the commission. Uh, it is, uh, the, the, the logos capture very well the kind of governance and uh, you, I mean, some of these logos look like they were drawn by hand by the child of the chair over breakfast or morning on a napkin and others look like very corporate entities where a graphic designer developed the logo and that's exactly the way that the, that the special group network is lots of diversity in the way that the chairs uh, approach their work and implement their actions. Now at the center of all the work that we do in SSC, and this is the main part of my presentation, uh, which, because I think is very relevant to this discussion, but so the center of all that we do is what we call the species conservation cycle. This is the, the kind of conceptual framework for the species strategic plan that we developed together with the Secretariat. And there are uh, three primary components, assess, plan, act. At the center of this cycle is the SSC network. And then here in gray, uh, enveloping the whole cycle is communicate. So the idea is that we begin with assessments. Those assessments lead to plans. The plans lead to action. And then it comes back to assessments again as in a, in a perpetual cycle as we implement conservation action and hopefully uh, reduce the rate, risk of extinction of species. Now I'm going to go grad just uh, I'm just going to speak a little bit about each one of these different components. So perhaps the best known uh, tool that IUCN has is the Red List of Threatened Species, which is funny because it's not really a list and it's not about threatened species. It really is an extensive database with information on all species, not only those that are threatened. Uh, a, a very uh, special characteristic of the Red List is that all species are classified according to extinction risk, giving us some sense of the urgency and, and the risk that species are facing. There are this number is a little bit uh, outdated. There are about 120 species, 120,000 species assessed so far. And the number of threatened is usually around 30%. Now, the, the, the Red List is a living document. We're constantly adding new species and updating those that are there. So it's an evolving uh, information. But something that is very important for the scientific community is that Red List assessments uh, are given a digital object identifier, which means that they are valid as scientific publications. So it's an interesting uh, element for people who are pursuing an academic career to be able to contribute uh, the Red List uh, science. Uh, the planning is the second component of the species conservation cycle. We have developed together with the, the conservation planning specialist group a series of tools and guidelines uh, for species conservation planning. There on the screen you will see a document that was published a couple of years ago. There's a new version of this uh, coming up very soon. And the idea is that CPSG uh, provides the, the, the tools, the toolbox really, for, for those that are involved in, in in assessment, planning, and acting to be able to develop these action plans. Another uh, uh, example that will be very interesting for you, I think, is this project of Itila leads this project, so she can tell you more about it. But uh, the, main, the main point that I want to say here is that this is an example of how you take the information of the Red List and turn it into other tools. So for example, BASPA, uh, uh, not only supports the development of the national ecosystem, but also 
the, the identification and delineation of key biodiversity areas. So the, this kind of package of species, ecosystems, and areas is the approach that SSC promotes so that we uh, empower local authorities and local organizations to take the experience and the tools that IUCN develops, but to apply them at the national context. And that is a very important aspect of the work that we do at SSC, is how do we contribute at the national level, at the regional level. And I'm, very, I'm sure that you'll be interested to learn more about this. And uh, well, they have, is, uh, I know it's also interested in taking these efforts uh, forward in the region. Conservation action, the third one. Uh, I'll show you a couple of examples. Uh, we have developed, and uh, I bring this up as an, as an idea that we can also think about. Uh, Sumatran Rhino Rescue is an initiative that was uh, promoted, initiated by the government of Indonesia, uh, but has brought together global wildlife conservation, international rhino foundations, the SSC, National Geographic and World Wildlife Fund, and the, the six of us together work on saving Sumatran rhinos. This is probably the most threatened vertebrate in the world, terrestrial vertebrate in the world. And we um, are working together, uh, designing the, the urgent actions and uh, uh, raising the funds necessary to implement them. So um, the idea with this project is to serve as a model for replication with other species in other regions. Uh, and it's definitely the kind of uh, work that brings together all kinds of different organizations in the thinking and the acting around species safety. Um, as you, as I mentioned before, the, the conservation planning specialist group has developed uh, a method for designing and creating action plans. Well, this um, <clears throat> initiative here on the screen the recovery of species on the brink of extinction is a is a project initiated by National Geographic and Fundación Segre in support of IUCN SSC, which what it does is that it provides funds for the implementation of action plans. So if a specialist group has gone through the assessment of risk of extinction on the red list, and then they have developed their action plans. Well, this with these funds, they can implement those action plans and close the species conservation cycle. <clears throat> so this was very interesting for us because it allowed, it gave an incentive to specialist groups to develop their plans and uh, identify priorities uh, for, for uh, reducing extinction risk. So this is the kind of, uh, kind of closing the cycle effort that we look forward to. Now, the network at the center of the, of the Assess Plan Act, the Species Conservation Cycle, is the, the, the SSC network. And an important support for all of this is the chairs team. We have a team of about 18 people in seven countries, all working to support the work of the network. And uh, we focus on, a, on four primary areas. On the network itself, on strategic planning and, and operations, uh, developing partnerships and communications. Partnerships for us are key. Most of the work that we do, we do in collaboration with other organizations and uh, developing a strong partnership with you would be an absolute priority for us and finding ways that we can engage both at the level of the chair's office team, but also at the level of the network itself. So let's, let's um, you know, with this, I hope that we're beginning, what well, I'm sure, that we're beginning a, uh, a long productive relationship uh, for all of us. Um, at the moment, the SSC uh, chair's team relies on four, sorry, on 32 organizations that provide support. These are organizations that, that make a contribution, an annual contribution to the work of SSC, and they help us keep our team together. Uh, Environmental Agency Abu Dhabi, there at the top left, is our primary sponsor, followed by Global Wildlife Conservation and Alain Zhu. Those three are our our strongest partners, but all of all the partners, of course, are equally important to us because they allow us to keep working. So I'm very grateful to all of them. Uh, a, a new a new mode that we're developing in the last four years is to build what we call red list hubs, and these are a specific kind of partnership that is based at different uh, primary at zoos and aquariums, which are uh, places where 
teams of experts that are hired by those organizations to support the work of SSC. They're not our employees, they don't work for IUCN, they work for the specific organizations as employees, but or as staff, but they their time is devoted to doing red listing and to doing conservation planning. We have very, very productive and uh, excellent relationships with the DEEP. It's an aquarium in the UK, Ostanario in Boa in Portugal, Albuquerque Biopark in New Mexico in the US, Georgia Aquarium also in the US, and Parque das Aves in Brazil. We're in the process of discussing other partnerships like these in other parts of the world, and uh, we're very interested to hear your thoughts about maybe uh, becoming a regional hub in, in, in the Middle East or, or the Arabian Peninsula. We recently established uh, our, biggest, our biggest partnership to date, which is with Indianapolis Zoo, to create the first global center for species survival. This is a very, very interesting model for us because they are going to hire uh, eight people, full-time employees of the Indianapolis Zoo, but whose entire uh, time is going to be devoted to the SSC to help us support the network. So it's a really interesting uh, and very positive effort because it will take, it doesn't uh, put the financial burden on the AUC and RSSC, they absorb those costs, but they also uh, work with us very closely. So in, in practice, they effectively increase the size of the chair's office team by seven or eight new people uh, while not giving us the pressure of having to uh, hire and manage them in a human resources perspective. <clears throat> now, the final of these components, communicate. Uh, we have, this is, is a new area for us. It's only been around for two years, since 2019. And what we, what we do, we have a, a communications officer, and her job is to help us, on the one hand, you know, promote the work of specialist groups, also help people build their plans around Assess Plan Act, and also take the work that we do beyond SSC and AUCN and, and try to inspire other organizations uh, to work with us. We produce quarterly reports. This is a, a document that we produce uh, electronically online that allows us to communicate with our members and with others. Uh, we invite you, uh, Ahab or, or, or the Granic Botanic Gardens, or both, uh, to write in our, in our quarterly report to share your vision and your ideas. We try to avoid having kind of descriptive uh, pieces. We try to, we're much more interested in thought-provoking, controversial, challenging positions that make the membership think and create discussion and make us advance uh, conservation. So it's not, it's not a place really for, for reporting your work. It's a place really more for helping us think and expand and open new frontiers in conservation. We also have social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and we invite you to join us there and also share information with us. Um, and as we are closing this first quadrennium um, of, uh, of my team, so as you know, the UCN elects a new chair for the Species Survival Commission every four years, and uh, I am up for re-election at the next World Conservation Congress in January, and so far there are no other candidates, so the chances are that I will remain chair for four more years. Now, one very big priority for us into the future is this program that I am showing you here called Reverse the Red. Reverse the Red is a new initiative that we're developing in partnership with the World Association of Zoos and Aquariums, Tangle, Tangle Bank Studios, San Diego Zoo Global, On the Edge Conservation, and the Smithsonian Earth Optimism to take uh, and, and reverse the red. Reverse the red means reverse the trends that we observe on the red list and try to inject optimism and collaboration uh, into the conservation world so that we are effectively able to guarantee the survival of all species that we share the planet with. Reverse the red uh, is focused at the national level. It, the, the, the way that we see it internally in SSC, <coughs> sorry, it's taking the species conservation cycle and applying it nationally. So how do we develop working groups in nations or regions 
that are able to use all the tools of IUCN to make the suspicious ecosystem KBAs, for example, like Domitila is doing with PASPA in Africa, and then improve the state of the species globally. There's, a, there's, there's much more to share about this. In addition to these partners on the screen, there are about 20 other partners joining us for the Reverse the Red Pavilion at the World Conservation Congress. Uh, and I'll be very happy to talk about this in more detail with any of you later. So uh, that's all, I, all that I have, as a brief introduction to SSC. I look forward to future conversation and exchanges. And uh, I have shared uh, my presentation with the organizers. So if anybody is interested in any, uh, any of the slides or the text there, please feel free to write me if you want me to send it to you or just uh, 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 thank you to all the photographers and everybody else. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dr. John, uh, for this uh, presentation. And for sure, all the topics will be available for the the speakers and for the, for the public um, through the Quran Botanic Garden and anybody is welcome to, to uh, will share all of these documents, inshallah. Uh, now we'll uh, go for uh, Dr. Dumitella uh, Ramindo, the Deputy Chair of the ISN Species of Labor Commission uh, to talk about the groups and uh, uh, from the ISN uh, Species of Labor Commission. Please go ahead. Thank you. Can I hope you can hear? Yeah, yeah we um, are. Good day, everybody. I'm very, very, it's a big pleasure to be here with you all today. Um, so as John Paul mentioned, I am um, his deputy chair for the Species Survival Commission, but I also head up the Plant Conservation Committee. So I just thought I would give you a little bit of an understanding about the work that we do within the plant section of the Species Survival Commission. Um, and the, the Plant Conservation Committee's role is specifically to, to help oversee and guide all the different plant specialist groups that we have in the network. Okay, so at the moment, what we've done for the Plant Conservation Committee in this quadrennium is to change it from quite, what was previously the situation is we had a, a strong taxonomic plant um, expertise base. So we had experts from different plants plant families on the, on the, on the group. And we um, changed it at the beginning of this quadrennium to try to get a very strong global representation. And so currently on the, on, on the Plant Conservation Committee, we have got chairs of, of the, um, the specialist groups that have very high plant endemisms in their, in their regions, as well as the big um, plant conservation research institutions like um, Kew Gardens and Missouri Botanic Gardens and then um, the Botanic Gardens Conservation International Group. And we still have some taxonomic representation with ebony, cycads and cactuses. And then we also were very conscious about bringing the thematic areas of the work in. And I'll show you now when we talk about the um, focuses of the work that we're doing to make sure that, that the work of the plant network is covering um, plants that are really important for people and things like medicinal plants, crop wild relatives, timber species, etc. Um, and then also making sure that we have an exit and in situ focus. So this group is very passionate and we, we meet every every three months virtually um, and we do we try really to to bring the work into the different parts of the world that we operate in. Okay this map shows here the the um, where we have plant specialist groups we, we have at the moment um, 30, 32 plant specialist groups. This is not showing the taxonomic groups. We have taxonomic groups like orchid specialist groups, cycad specialist group, cactus specialist group, many others, palm specialist group. But this is just showing you the, the, the plant specialist groups that are, that are regionally based. And as you know, the, the Arabian plant specialist group, the former one, um, was the first one that was regionally organized. Um, and now we're very, very pleased that this group is being reinstated and, and um, um, will will play a very important role. So the the blue groups are the are the groups that already existed before this quadrennium, and then the yellow ones are the, and the green ones are the ones that we've recently started. Um, and you will see that we're really concentrating on 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 picking up the gaps. So the the map behind the red areas are the areas of high plant diversity for the world, the hotspots. And then I think 
you're probably all aware that the plant hotspots are defined. I mean, the, the, the biodiversity hotspots of the world are defined based on the number of endemic plants that occur in an area. So it's really great that we would be starting this group to help catch um, the top of the Arabian Peninsula area. And also, obviously, we would like as many parts of the, of, of, of the world's plants covered. So I think your group will really help to, to fill in um, a very important area of the world. Okay, then I'll just take you through some of the focal areas that we would really like all plant groups to work on and um, which we've been pushing. So, so, so the first is red listing and John Paul mentioned the red list work and um, um, our first speaker also mentioned that this is something that you would like to focus on, which is really very, very exciting. Um, so, so conducting red list assessments, what we like to see is that in species that are restricted in their range, endemic, um, have full detailed conservation red list assessments done for them. Um, but we also really try, if possible, to, to get as many plants in a region assessed. So, so instead of just doing what, what we call cherry picking, just choosing the ones that experts might know or have knowledge on, it's really very important if you have the capacity to try to assess all the plants in your region. Um, and we, the way we're helping to make this faster and easier is for those species that are widespread and common there's a tool that, that, that the Plant Conservation Committee has developed that you see on the screen here at the moment that you, you can quickly run your plant records through and it automatically does an assessment for you. Um, and, and normally those are least concerned assessments and fills in the information that you need to make it acceptable to the IUCN. So those are for widespread species. And then for all the species that are special, that they are harvested, are useful, those are the species that you would like your experts to work very carefully on um, following the IUCN criteria. Um, at the moment, we're, we're pushing forward to try to get a lot of the, the, the mega diverse regions of the world covered. There's lots of gaps. And um, so assessments are, are coming through from the, the countries that are on the screen. And then another very big project is to do a global assessment of all trees. So 60,000 tree species are currently being assessed. We hope to make this target by the end of the year. It's a really, really big challenge. Um, and, if, and if we don't quite make it, we'll finish it in the next year or two. So a lot of assessment work going on on trees. Okay, the second focal area that we would like all plant groups to focus on, and, and this has not been in place in the past, is a focus on sustainable use. Um, we are concerned that many of our plants are unsustainably used. And many of the plants that are on CITES, for example, do not yet have a red list assessment done and don't have SSC experts that are guiding the decisions that get made for those species. So what we would like to see is that um, each group does cover the CITES species that are, are from their region and also um, works on gathering constant knowledge of what's taking place with harvesting. Is it sustainable? Is it not sustainable? can it help to develop um, sustainable practices. And there's some very useful tools that have been developed um, and, and, and are available for your group if you're interested um, to, to, um, to follow to, to ensure sustainable um, practices are in place. So that's the second focus. And so, so when, as you're setting up your new group, an important thing to think about is have you brought in experts um, from that work on sustainable use? Okay, and um, then the third focal area is ex situ conservation and reintroduction work. Um, as I think you all know that, um, and I see that you're, you're structuring your group around um, the, the plant conservation strategy, it's very important. The, all the work of our, of our plant network is focused on um, implementing the global strategy for plant conservation. And the new global strategy for plant conservation that's currently under development has a very, very strong focus on reintroduction work and recovery work and, and restoration work. And this was missing in, in the former versions of the, of the, plant the global plant conservation strategy. So, so what we're promoting is this continuum between in situ and ex situ work where um, threatened plants are cultivated in botanical gardens, but that there's strong programs to ensure they're being reintroduced into the wild. So habitat restoration work and, um, and, and actually learning what it takes to restore these plants. And some, some species, especially arid um, specialist species, 
this can be very complicated to understand what they actually need to survive. And so there's quite a lot of research that has to go in with this work. Um, but we're, we're very keen that all specialist groups have a focus on reintroduction work and that links to the action component, the Assess Plan Act work that John Paul was talking about earlier. Um, and typically, plant specialist groups in the SSC have traditionally focused mainly on the red listing part, on the assessment part, and not actually on the, on the action part. And so we're very keen to get those links. So the, the, you know, our partnerships with botanic gardens are incredibly important, and many specialist groups need to have um, be hosted by, by botanic, bot botanic gardens if possible, and if not, then to have many botanic gardens as part of their group. Okay, and then the last thing, we're doing a lot of work with um, policy support. So, so our group, the, the, the Plant Conservation Committee has been feeding the, the, um, the, the requests from the network, from the different specialist groups, and into the new um, plant conservation strategy, which is being developed at the moment. We are sitting with um, the challenge of really trying to embed the new plant conservation strategy within the post, the, the the post-2020 biodiversity framework, the new CBD's post-2020 framework. And this is challenging <laughs> because there's not always a strong plant link to each one of the proposed new targets. And also those targets change constantly as the negotiation processes go forward. So before the plant conservation strategy stood completely alone, but now it, it, the, the, the CBD secretariat has said the only way that the plant conservation strategy will ma be maintained as part of the CBD um, commitments for countries is if it's completely embedded. So this is it's what we're doing. We're tracking um, each meeting that happens with the CBD. We'll keep on submitting um, 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 requests of, of what the new strategy should look like. And as I mentioned before, the most important part is the, the, the new and strong focus on recovery and reintroduction. work. Okay, and then lastly, um, the in-situ conservation side for plants is very important. And the best way that, 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 that we can support this work is to, is to identify those really important areas for plants. And um, um, the, the IUCN is a partner um, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the standard for identifying key biodiversity areas. And that standard has only been available for the last two years. And it, we're now piloting identifying key biodiversity areas in different places of the world. And most key biodiversity areas have been identified using vertebrate information. So birds, reptiles, mammals, etc. cetera. Um, but interestingly, where we have actually started to use plant data, plant data is really making a big difference to the number of areas that are identified. We've just finished a huge um, assessment of key biodiversity areas in my country, South Africa, and more than 60% of the areas um, that were identified um, as key biodiversity areas were identified because of triggers from plants. So it's very, very important that you, you take your information of where your special plants are. Um, once they're red listed, you can't identify KBAs before the red listing process is done. Once the, the red listing process is done, you then um, use the key biodiversity area standard to identify them. And um, so so that's, that's where we're at. And we've also been testing the green list um, new standard on conservation success and recovery of species. Um, this is very new and will, will probably be um, launched at the World Conservation Congress, the new, the, the, the new guidelines for identifying green list species. Um, and so this will be a really also a very useful thing for your group to think about, to, to think about including. Okay, so that's it from our side. I hope it gives you some some things to think about and and the plant conservation committee is here to support you we're quite low on capacity at the moment just because everybody is struggling with the with the covid and um, pandemic and, and and additional responsibilities but from hopefully from the next two months we'll have a dedicated plant um, coordinator based in the indianapolis center who would be like the person who would be available to help and support every step of the way but i'm very open to helping uh, ihab has ready um, um, reached out with, with, with the first versions of the proposal. I'm very happy to help you as you finalize your proposal and as you get working. And um, so we are extremely excited about your new group. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Domitella, for this. And Land Conservation Committee, we are looking to be uh, to work with 
with the, to be a part of this after the revival of the uh, uh, the, the specialist Arabian plant specialist group. Actually, we had uh, a serious problem that yes, we, we are working the ice and red listing, but in circuit islands. Uh, maybe Dr. Hatim will show that the efforts in Jordan, but here, as Ms. Fatnet mentioned, we are working, but there is no actual work for that list here, for example. Uh, and also the, for the trade and this kind of stuff. Uh, we hope so to work closely together. Right now we are, we are going from top bottom approach. Yeah, Dr. John talked about the SSC and now you are talking about the Species, Project, uh, species uh, Conservation Committee. And Dr. Rehab will talk to us about the, the West Asia, the uh, Species Project Commission and West Asia efforts. Please Dr. Rehab, uh, you can. Yes, uh, thank you so, so much, uh, Ahmed, for the introduction and the excellent facilitation that you are doing. And uh, if I may first to convey my appreciation to the Quranic Botanic Garden uh, of Qatar Foundation, led by Ms. Fatima, for the excellent and extraordinary effort that you are doing uh, in the field of plant conservation. And uh, of course, having the leadership of the SSC today with us, uh, represented by Dr. John, Ball and also uh, Dr. Dumitella is highly appreciated and acknowledged and it shows how much, uh, let's say, achievement we can and, and the progress we can have in uh, the coming future. And the presentation that was uh, made so far are uh, great. I think they paved the way and they give the, the ideas of how the, the IUCN is working, how the SSC is also working, what are the pillars of the SSC. Uh, generally, and uh, of course, I, I liked very much the presentation that that was done by Dr. Dumidella. I have learned a lot, by the way, from this uh, presentation, so thank you so much. Well, uh, I, I will be very brief uh, just to give the floor to my colleagues who will present about the plant conservation, but I thought to, to have this opportunity to highlight uh, that we need uh, to strengthen the, the, the persons of experts and scholars and uh, people uh, with with vast uh, experiences in, in different disciplines like the zoology, uh, botany, and all of this within the SSC network. And maybe Dr. Uh, John, his presentation, he have showed that uh, maybe the least uh, region uh, represented within the Species Survival Commission Specialist Group is West Asia. And this will this give a huge burden on our shoulders on how to you know to to reach out, how to 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 tell uh, our colleagues uh, in this region that uh, you can contribute your knowledge, you can contribute your uh, uh, skills, research, to build partnership, and also uh, how uh, to uh, look uh, to opportunities uh, to expand the work and put it in the right framework or the right directions. And I guess this is something we, uh, the experts from this region, should do. It's, it's not someone who will invite us. I, I, I'm always believing that if anyone would like to, to proceed in his life, he should, be, he should have the initiative from him, himself. I hope all of the attendants uh, today, and I thank them, by the way, uh, my, aversion, my appreciation goes to them for their attendance. I hope they will start uh, looking how they can be engaged uh, based on their experiences. The Arabian Blood Specialist Group is, I would say, it will be the base to, I hope, to ignite the, the, the scholars and the experts from West Asia to start looking more carefully how they can be engaged and how they can share their experiences and their research that is being done. I know that in our region there are lots of, uh, there are so many efforts uh, about conservation. Uh, but I think we need uh, to, to highlight it, to, to put it in the international framework. And the IUCN is, the, is really the hub because it's at the end uh, the entity uh, which, I will, which I consider as a knowledge hub worldwide. So uh, hopefully this group will be the, the start, but of course it's not the, the only uh, way. There are other opportunities we are I'm aiming for actually for this uh, region. And of course, uh, our association goes to our leadership in the SSC because they are always supporting uh, any initiative which will come from here and it will be directed to the species conservation. 
Uh, again, I, I do not want to take uh, more time, so I will uh, stop here and I would like again to acknowledge this uh, webinar and I am looking really forward for the future. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Hav, for this brief talk uh, about the West Asia uh, Space Survival Commission uh, and the efforts in, uh, in the region. I uh, just uh, uh, want to remind the, the participants, if you wanted to listen to the Arabic, please go down and press interpretation and choose French in order to listen to the Arabic. We'll convert it into Arabic for the Sada al Mushahideen and Mustamaeen. You can come about the interpretation of the French language. Uh, now we will go to Dr. Thuraya Saeed, the chairperson of the Arabian Plan Specialist Group, in order to talk to us about the, the group and the strategy. And then Dr. Tony Miller, inshallah, will talk about the history of this group in the past. So let's welcome Dr. Thuraya to talk to us about the, what is the Arabian Plan Specialist Group and the, and the objective of this group in the region. Please, Dr. Thuraya. Thank you so much, Ahmed. Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Can you see my screen? It's shared already with all of you? Okay. So, yes, your screen is very clear. Okay. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, it's my uh, pleasure to be with uh, all of you today uh, on this very important uh, webinar um, discussing the most important uh, issue in our region. And uh, uh, before I start, I would like also to uh, give a special thank to uh, the Quran uh, Botanic Garden Qatar, um, Dr. Fatma and Mr. Ahmed uh, for their uh, great efforts in um, making this happen. And a special thank for uh, Ihab Eid for his uh, usual support for all of us. Uh, in my presentation, um, I will talk about uh, the Arabian uh, Plant Specialist Group. Um, I will focus on the background of the group uh, it is objectives. Uh, the and very quickly, I will talk about the success of the group uh, during the last uh, uh, period. Uh, the, the, the key threats facing the plant species in Arabian Peninsula. And I will end with the key future activities uh, of the group. So um, as my previous uh, colleagues, uh, they give great presentations about the SSC and uh, the importance of the different uh, groups in the commission. Uh, it comes uh, the Arabian Plant Specialist Group, which established in 1996 um, under the chair of uh, Dr. Abdelaziz Biznadel. Um, uh, uh, the Secretary General of the National Commission for Wildlife in uh, Kingdom Saudi Arabia at that time. And I will take this opportunity to thank him so much and the Vice Chair uh, during that time for the great efforts and activities for the conservation of the plants. Uh, the uh, Arabian Plant Specialist Group uh, was the first uh, SSC specialist group to have a geographical coverage rather than taxonomic. And uh, during that time, the geographical coverage include the Arabian Peninsula, uh, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, and Iraq. Uh, the members uh, in the group um, involved uh, specialists from national and international concerned bodies on uh, plant issues, botanic gardens, uh, academia, and governmental and non-governmental bodies. Um, one of the earliest decision uh, for the group during that time was developing a five-year plan, which aligned with the global strategy for, for the plant conservation and um, uh, focused more, uh, mostly on the wild uh, accessible work list of knowing plant species at uh, different uh, levels and also preliminary assessment of the conservation status of all known species at national, uh, regional, and international levels, and also focusing on the protection of the most important areas for plant diversity in the region.
sorry. Uh, the objective uh, for establishing uh, the group, there are so many objectives, but the main one um, is to bring all the interested parties together to agree on the standards and protocols for each country uh, in achieving international targets, um, as we said, with the global uh, strategy like uh, important plant areas, uh, red list, and uh, the uh, others' activities. Um, also, uh, ensuring a regional consensus in approach and data sharing combinations with all um, uh, scientists and um, interested parties. Prepare a complete species that is list, especially for countries uh, where their uh, habitats are more subjected to severe degradation from different factors. Um, update the global uh, uh, strategy for the plant uh, uh, conservation targets uh, from the post also 2020 framework. Uh, promote and implement red listing uh, networking institution, this is very important, how we build all the networking and communications with all the different parties. Build partnership uh, for plant research and conservation in the region and developing evidence um, region, uh, based on the regional policy and guidelines for conservation. Um, also, it's very important to aim at cap uh, building capacities and rising awareness on the importance of the conservation of the plants and the threats that are facing the plant species in the, uh, in the region. Uh, promoting the use of native regional flora of landscaping and also uh, replacing exotic species that may become potentially invasive. If we talk about the success of the uh, group uh, during uh, the last uh, few years, uh, Dr. Tony will talk in more details about uh, the success uh, projects and, and uh, successful activities that have been conducted uh, during the last uh, few years. But the most important uh, projects that have been done so far in some areas in the region uh, was the important plant areas preparing of the IUCN red listing and uh, conducting a forum for the botanists in the, in the region where they gathered all the uh, concerned um, uh, scientists about the plants, discussing different issues and coming out, uh, out with uh, a very uh, important uh, recommendations on how we can work all together to conserve uh, the plant uh, in our region. There are different uh, threats um, uh, or, or key conservation issues that facing the plant species in our region. Um, I don't want to talk in more details because Dr. Tony also will cover this, but the most important, as you know, the habitat lose due to different uh, factors like degradation, pigmentation caused by overgrazing or developments. Uh, uh, by uh, building highways or roads or housing or hotels. Also, in some um, areas, uh, there is a lack of a specific regulation for the conservation of the flora and also the deficiencies in the implementation of such laws and decrees. Um, the, the most important um, threats that are facing most of the countries around the world the invasive species. Um, and, uh, and here we have uh, different uh, species which are concerned now or listed as invasive species. And we have uh, to work all together, although there are a lot of uh, procedures and activities that have been done so far uh, for the conserving of the plants, but for the invasive species, we should work all together to have um, like a regional or national stra specific strategy for the invasive uh, species. Um, lack of research, although many research have been conducted, but still on some areas, uh, there is a gap like um, climate change and is, it is uh, impacts on the uh, vegetations. We need to work more um, on this uh, subject. 
the gap of knowledge in the distribution and the status of many species also uh, not covered uh, by all the countries. Um, there is a need of the overcome uh, the, the gaps of the knowledge and the distribution and the status of many species, uh, which cause that the deficiencies um, in, in, the, in the countries. Um, for the future activities, uh, we are looking forward really uh, to bring all the uh, interested parties uh, together and uh, this will help uh, to deliver on the conservation status of the taxa and the threats faced with the plants in our, uh, in our uh, region. Um, therefore, it is extremely important also to fill the gaps uh, by creating this group uh, to be detected uh, to the Arabian plants observations. Uh, we are looking forward uh, of developing a 10-year action plan aligned with all the international strategies and framework uh, concerning the plant conservation, uh, address changes in the flora and identify the status of a plant species in, in, in Arabia, establishing a database uh, or uh, online platform to gather all the research, all the information, all the data on the plants uh, in the region. Uh, to have more uh, works on the surveying and data sharing between all the concerned uh, parties, set priorities and develop a species conservation action plan, especially when we're talking about the endemic and threatened species. Uh, the group also will play a vital uh, leading role in the regional efforts and strength communication and networking for plant conservation, supporting existing uh, initiatives, uh, which have been already uh, exist uh, in relative to invasive species uh, at regional level. Um, also, the guidelines for monitoring will be uh, developed and early warming system uh, of the invasive species at national level. Development of guidelines or strategy on the restoration of degraded habitats, development and enhancement, rising uh, public awareness. This is very important to, to raise the uh, public awareness about the importance of the plants, their status, and how we can all uh, work together in conserving of the plants and develop and enhance uh, the role of region botanic garden. Now I will give the mic to Dr. Tony, who will elaborate more about the different activities and the successful stories of the group that have been achieved so far in the region. Dr. Tony, please. Thank you, Dr. Suray and uh, Dr. Tony, who represent the successful stories uh, for the Arabian plant specialist group in the past. Dr. Tony, one of the well-known expert uh, scientist but, uh, in botany uh, in the region. Uh, Dr. Tony is one of the founders also as well for the Arabian Plant Specialist Group. He is the one uh, uh, can give us the history of this group and what, 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 uh, what's done in, in the past and what's going in the future, inshallah. And Dr. Tony as well, he will the one will give us the priorities for the, the next five years at the end of this session. Please, Dr. Tony Grant. Uh, Good afternoon, everybody. Can you, can you see the screen? Yeah, your screen is Yeah, that's okay, good, yes. Um, so I'm going to carry on this presentation by looking at some of the, the sort of achievements that the old Arabian plant specialist crab uh, made, had, and then look at some of the challenges of the region. Um, so as Th Dr. Thrayer said, one of the earliest decisions of the Arabian plant specialist group was to align its scientific objectives with those of the global strategy for plant conservation. Um, and the global, the global strategy is a program of the Convention of Biological Diversity, and it's agreed by 196 governments around the world. Its vision, which I think everybody here can agree with, is that without plant, there is no life. The functioning of the planet, our survival depends on plants. The strategy seeks to halt the, the, the continuing loss of plant diversity. So it's a very noble vision. Um, the global framework itself has 16 targets and this current strategy ends in 2020, so this year. So it's an ideal moment to take stock of the progress that's been made regionally against these targets and then identify gaps and priorities 
as a guide to develop action plans for the new Arabian plant specialist group. So, as I mentioned, there are 16 targets for the global strategy arranged in five objectives. I don't expect you to look at all of this, but we're going to be covering some of these later on in the, in the webinar. So, Dr. Alazi is talking about taxonomic problems, um, which is target one, because of course you can't conserve what you don't know. Um, Hutton Typhur is looking at red listing in Jordan, and I should mention that actually quite good progress has been made in red listing in the Arabian Peninsula. We now have provisional uh, red list of all the endemics in the peninsula. Um, Dr. Sophie Neal, we're looking at the important plant area program in Oman. Um, Dr. Lawati, we're looking at the socio-economic conservation strategy for medicinal plants, so target nine. Dr. Shahin Abdazanfar will be looking at um, the cultural heritage through plants, target 13. Um, and I think it's worth noting that the, there's a lot of crossover between these various targets. I then wanted to look at some of the, 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 the real challenges facing the region. And I think everybody who's worked in the region recognizes that over, overgrazing is a regional problem. So this is highly degraded rangeland with Razia Stricter in Saudi Arabia. And this is addressed by target 14, where, which says at least 50% of each ecological region of vegetation tape secured through effective management and or restoration. What it really means is restoration programs. And it's quite interesting to see just the success that you have on, in, on, on, on restoration programs in desert. So this is work done by Gary Brown in Q8. On the left, we have an area uh, completely degraded, overgrazed in 2004. Just two years later, after protection, no, no active measures were taken, purely fence and just protection. Two years, you return to something that looks really, beginning to look like really quite a healthy desert. And I, I note with interest that restoration is going to be one of the areas that the new um, Species Survival Commission is going to be concentrating on. And I, it's good to note that there is quite a lot of new initiatives in the Arabian Peninsula now, from the juniper woodlands through to desert conservation through to mangroves. So a lot of restoration, active restoration programs are going on. Um, Dr. Thrayer mentioned invasive weeds. Um, I think every, again, everybody who works in the region recognizes the, 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 the massive, uh, uh, the importance or rather the, the badness of the Prosopis juliflora, which is a serious invasive in many, in many areas of the peninsula. Um, target 10 um, looks at the effective management plans to prevent new biological invasion to manage important plant important areas for plant diversity that are invaded. Um, so one of the steps that taken towards looking at invasive species was a, an invasive species workshop, which we carried out in 2017 in Riyadh. And we came up with a preliminary list of non-native invasive species. And this is very much a preliminary list and it needs, definitely needs shooting at, but it does highlight some of the major invasives here. Luckily in Arabia, it, invasives aren't really a major problem apart the prosopis, flora, uh, things like Apuntia in the in the woodlands of the southwest region, and then things like the Nicandra physaloides, which is a serious problem in the interesting grasslands in the south of the peninsula and on Socotra. Again, one of the roles of the Arabian plant, uh, especially community, is going to be part of communicating, educating, and raising public awareness programs. And actually one of the, the really big moves and one of the big things that has happened in the Arabian Peninsula over the last few years is the emergence of a number of new botanic gardens. Some are being established, uh, such as the Amman Botanic Garden, which is not open yet, but being built. Um, others such as the Royal Botanic Garden in Jordan is well established. The map on the top left shows proposed and established gardens. For everything, as I say, from large botanic gardens to small botanic gardens like the Socotra Botanic Garden and the Mumu Sops Garden in Saudi Arabia. All of these share in their um, the importance of uh, communicating uh, botanical issues, botanical problems. So I think the, the role of botanic gardens is going to be incredibly important. And it's interesting to note, of course, that this webinar is being 
uh, hosted by the, the Quranic Botanic Garden in Qatar. Um, I wanted to sort of, I, I didn't want to spend too long on this, but I wanted to look, mention one issue, which I think one big problem, which actually highlights a lot of the issues in the region. This is the marshes, the regional problem, which sort of requiring both regional and global solutions. So probably everybody's aware of the Mesopotamian marshes with this wonderful culture, the Sumerian culture, the, the place where writing originated, the first civilization, the first laws, the first towns. It's still, small patches are still there. So we still see this, this interesting uh, uh, people still exist there, but it's going downhill very, very rapidly, or rather has gone downhill very rapidly. And you can see here on the, this map here, the green on the left shows the previous extent of the marsh in 73, the extent in the year 2000. This has increased slightly, but is beginning to go down again now. The draining of the Mesopotamian marshes has been described by the United Nations as a tragic human environmental catastrophe on a par with the deforestation of the Amazon rainforest and by other people is the worst, one of the worst environmental disasters of the 20th century. So it really is a major, of major importance, but it has an importance beyond just the, uh, the immediate area of Mesopotamia or the southern Iraq. So what caused this? Well, I think, again, these are challenges and threats which are facing the whole region. So climate change, reducing the snowfall, the precipitation on the mountains which feed the Tigris and the Euphrates. Um, the actual political issue of draining the marshes. So in 1991, the marshes were actually drained, physically drained. Now, after the, the, the drains were, were blocked, the marshes recovered to some extent, but then large dams have become to appear. The map on the left shows the green dots show dams which are damming parts of the Tigris and Euphrates right the way over the, the drainage bowl. And, and these big dams like the Atatürk Dam in Turkey, and they're stopping the water which was feeding the dams. And there's basically not enough water coming down to these regions anymore. This is causing the vegetation to disappear, no, no, remote, the, no vegetation left. The soil is very fine alluvial soils. When it's exposed, it's easily blown away. Overgrazing stops the reestablishment of vegetation. So what's the impact of this? This impact is is felt across the entire region. These are dust storms experienced in Riyadh. They're experienced all over the, all over the Gulf region, in fact, all over the Arabian Peninsula. Um, the, the dust can rise three, maybe three kilometers high. These sorts of dust storms used to occur maybe once every three or four years. Now they're occurring several times a year. So it's a major problem. The issue, of course, the solution is both regional, national, and actually global. So, and I think this is one, going to be one of the important functions of the Arabian Plant Specialist Group. And this is identified in Target 16, which is institution networks and partnerships for plant conservation established or strengthened at national, regional, international levels to achieve the targets of this strategy. So this is very much what the Arabian Plant Specialist Group is about. So it's really going to be about sharing knowledge, sharing skills, connecting people together. And I think this was one of the major successes of the old Arabian plant specialist group, that it brought people together. It allows us to share some of the, um, some of the good practices across the region. And I think, again, really, it just brought people together in, in quite an important way. So I, I really hope that the new Arabian plant specialist group will build on the work of the Arabian Arab, the old Arabian plant specialist group, and again, start to bring people together. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tony, for this uh, presentation. Yes, the Arabian plant specialist group is bringing all the people to work together in order to work on the vegetation issues, as you mentioned, uh, according to the global strategy for the plant conservation. Yes, we have efforts in uh, some efforts in the plant list, but we need to do more. We need, we have a taxonomic more, taxonomic problem in the region, Dr. Salah, as we'll talk about this. Uh, but we, we are here in order to maximize the efforts of the people in order to come with the projects to serve 
the uh, uh, and to face the challenges facing the the flora uh, uh, in the region. Uh, now we will uh, go with Dr. Hatim Taifur uh, to talk about the plant diversity and ice and red list projects in Jordan uh, Jordan uh, plant red list. And this is one of the major tasks of the uh, global strategy for the plant conservation, as Dr. Tony mentioned. And Dr. Hatim will highlight this issue uh, in Jordan. Please go to Hatim Grant. Assalamu alaikum. Um, thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk about uh, the Red List and Jordan's experience in this field. In order to shed light on the importance of plant assessment in developing uh, conservation plants and thus guiding uh, decision makers in developing uh, policy. As you see, uh, this subject consists of uh, two parts. Uh, these are Jordan, uh, Jordan plants and IUCN Red List. First, uh, let me start with introducing, uh, introducing some uh, facts about uh, the flora of Jordan. In 2017, the Royal Botanic Garden of Jordan, in cooperation with the Q Botanic Garden, published an annotated checklist uh, to doc uh, document all Jordanian flora. So far, a total of 2,531 plant species were, were recorded in Jordan. Also, although our knowledge about species diversity is quite good, but there is still significant lack of data regarding population size and the threats to species growth. Additionally, there are no accurate plan to conserve the species, and thus a lack of national conservation strategy is still needed. Therefore, Jordan Plant Trade List has been initiated by the Royal Botanic Garden of Jordan to produce a comprehensive flora database as a start point to establish at the National uh, Red Data Book. Getting back to the Red List, uh, the IUCN Red List uh, is the most common information source which provides a comprehensive information source on the conservation status of a plant and animals worldwide. In addition, they are the owner of the Red List mark. It's considered the starting point uh, for environmental recovery programs. This slide shows how the Red List works with the uh, with where nine uh, major categories uh, were listed. The threatened categories uh, are the major, major concern of the conservation uh, measures worldwide. The majority of world plants uh, sit in the not evaluated category. This means uh, that no assessment has yet been attempted for these species. Uh, often because they have uh, been uh, insufficient funds or uh, no enough data to assess those species. This is the first phase of a uh, national project aimed to preparing a comprehensive species database and to create and publish the Jordan plant red list. Four outputs were expected from the red list project. First, uh, help planners and decision makers in establishing an accurate uh, uh, management plan for conservation actions. Second, to determine the national conservation strategy for plant genetic resources. And third, to establish the national flora database. And finally, to uh, publish uh, the J Jordan Blank Redis. Jordan, like most countries around the world, has ratified international obligations to conserve and protect biological diversity. Some examples are CBD, uh, Global Strategy for Plant Conservation, Ramsar Convention, and CITES. Land Red List project is important and vital at the national level due to several reasons, including but not limited to support in gov governmental initiative to comply with international agreements, such as the CBD, and this work is used as an indicator to measure the achievement of Millennium Development Goal number seven and uh, use it as a tool to implement element of a global strategy of a plant conservation, target two, seven, and eight, and to provide data for updating cyclist analysis. Also, it's important to mention that this project is supporting the CBD strategy plan uh, in the time period between 2011 to, 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 to 2020 
and will fit within, uh, within target uh, 12. To be able to perform, to perform the red list process, uh, a consultation process was developed to identify gap analysis, where the first step entitles testing data quality and quantity by distributing the questionnaires to all national stakeholders and experts, followed by providing information by stakeholders and then assess uh, whatever it is suitable for using the red list or not. The final result is to divide the Jordanian plant into three groups according to the availability to the availability of data. So we get three groups out of 2,531 plant species recorded in Jordan. The assessment started with 1,072 species, which which is considered a priority group number one, where it's called it could be red uh, red list assist with the current knowledge. While uh, 911 species that require little additional population level data collection to be red list assist. And uh, it's considered as group number two. And we found that 548 species in Jordan uh, uh, listed as group number three, where it requires extensive uh, additional data collection for subsequent data collection. The work has been followed by several steps where the first step included data collection from uh, different uh, resources like uh, uh, national and international herbaria uh, and uh, from literature and from uh, scientific reports. Quality control mapping, expert workshops, reviewing the information, entering information to SIS, and finally publishing the red list are steps for, uh, or uh, work, work steps. The first step of data collection included a heavy work to ensure providing the best information on each taxon, where we managed to repatriate our data which means we got the Jordanian data from those who collected it from over many years ago. And we, collect, we collected data about taxonomic nodes and distribution, geographic distribution, where more than uh, 80,000 accession were collected from uh, different resources. Uh, from uh, very famous uh, herbaria like uh, Kew Garden Herbarium, herbarium and uh, Edinburgh herba herbarium. Also uh, data about population size and habitat and ecology, use and trade, threats and conservation action. To ensure that the data collected are up to standard, a quality control process was implemented by checking data uh, to avoid using very old recording uh, uh, checking the coordinates by avoiding using inaccurate way in documentation and reliability to avoid using records for misidentifying land. Mapping was an important step and what it is presented here is how we have dealt with each map. This was obtained, obtained of course from the IUCN criteria where the figure is to differentiate between area of occupancy and extent of occurrence. The diagram illustrates the effect of having a large extent of occurrence, but the same area of occupancy and the same fitting effect. The overall effect is that in figure one, suffered more from the same event than the, in the right hand example does, figure two. As you can see here, threats will affect an, uh, an area of occupancy more than extent of occurrence. National experts were joined together in a workshop to review the data collected, to provide their assessment to, uh, to each species. During the workshop, criteria were applied and assessment result was achieved. This was followed by entering data into the SIS, species information system, as a step to produce the final result, 
So all redress data is now available on SIS website. The final step is public publishing of the red list. The regional red list assessment for the blanks of Jordan produced a three volume series that documents the conservation status and the threat level of wild plants listed on Jordan blank checklist. These volumes are published by Royal Botanic Garden in Jordan in cooperation with IUCN and Ministry of Environment. The published report contains five major components, and these are taxonomic data, rational, uh, distribution map, and conservation status and threats, and then the references. Up to date, total number of blunt species assessed is 1984. 93 plant species, which, uh, which are uh, about 23% uh, percent of the total number are assessed as a threatened. As a result, with the publication of the first and second volumes, the percentage of the plant species that have been evaluated is 72%. of the red list at the national level is very important to know the conservation status of endemic species in each country, which is which is already represent the uh, conservation status at the global level. For example, Daphne uh, Macronata subspecies Linifolia is one of the endemic species in Jordan and that have been evaluated in the red book. Also, publication of the red list at the national level is very important to update the global geographical distribution of certain species. For example, in Jordan, until 2020, uh, 20, uh, uh, sorry, until the 2010, Fecus palmata was thought that this species had become extinct in the wild. But during the red listing process, small populations were recorded in the southern uh, mountain in Jordan. This is the global distribution of uh, Ficus palmata. As you see here, uh, uh, this species is found from Egypt to Central Asia in cold desert mountain. Since the mountains that overlooking the Dead Sea area are at the edge of the species range, that's why uh, this, this tree is very rare in Jordan. Uh, here, it's worth mentioning that uh, Ficus palmata has not yet been classified or uh, assessed by the IUCN at the global level. At the, at the regional level in Jordan, it's listed as endangered species. This regional assessment can help to give conservation status of this species at a global level. Outputs of Jordan plant red list were very useful to assess plants in the regional level. Uh, for example, in, uh, the IUCN Center of Mediterranean Cooperation organized a workshop to establish an IUCN red list of monocotyledon plants for the Mediterranean region. This assessment reviewed the conservation status of approximately 500 monocotyledon plants belonging to the Eastern Mediterranean region, according to the IUCN criteria. So uh, Jordan plant red list uh, information used in this workshop to assess those uh, species. Also, as part of regional collaboration, to assist the plant across the border, Sharga International Conservation Forum for Arabian Biodiversity Conference has successfully undertaken an assessment of the conservation status of all of the endemic plants and the trees of the Arabian Peninsula. Center for Middle uh, Eastern Plant, which is part of Royal Botanic Garden Edinburgh, facilitated uh, those workshops which involved researchers from across the region and internationally sharing knowledge and expertise. In this forum, the target was to give global conservation status for all endemic plants and to assist all trees and olive plants growing in the region. As outputs of the technical workshop, 232 endemic taxa, which are about 30% of the total number are assessed as a threat. Thank you very much.
uh, thank you, Dr. Hatem, so much. Uh, uh, it's not an easy task uh, to um, to assist all of this uh, plant species in Jordan, and of course, it takes a long time in order to come with all of these results uh, to make. Uh, uh, because people is asking, what 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 is the red list? The red list, uh, you may uh, anybody can can say for this plant, this plant is rare, for example. The word rare or latest concern or extinct or endangered, uh, this plant is a pleasure plant species. It, it needs a huge work in order, in order to evaluate and assess all the area and come with, uh, uh, as Dr. Hatton mentioned, the area of uh, occupancy and uh, extent of occurrence and, and calculate all of this plant species to say that this is rare or endangered or, or whatever uh, status. Uh, really, we need to work regionally and for the regional uh, work together. Uh, all, all the people in the region can work together in order to update the, the, the status of the IUCN. Uh, and here in the Coral Botanic Garden, I think we, we need to start something like this in order to evaluate and assist for the, uh, the plant species in Qatar. Thank you, Dr. Hatton, for this great presentation. And now we will uh, go with Dr. Ali Hussein Alawati. Uh, his, uh, uh, we will talk about the socio-economic plant conservation strategy for the uh, Sultanate Oman uh, from con conservation of the medicinal plants in situ and ex situ. And this is very important topic to, to talk about the socio-economics and how to link between the plants and people. Dr. Ali, please go. Ali, your mic. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Ahmed. Um, okay, uh, are you seeing my... Uh... Yeah, your presentation is clear. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for inviting invite me to this important uh, webinar. I will talk about the uh, socioeconomic plant species of the country and uh, give example for the medicinal plant in the country. Uh, the presentation will be divided for uh, five sectors. I will talk about the center and then the socioeconomic plant species list and the gap analysis that we found here with, with an example of insular plants for conservation, of course, and the activities of the center for conservation and conclusion. Uh, Oman Animal and Plant Genetic Resources Center uh, were established uh, for uh, getting the value from the genetic resources, which could be plants, animals, microorganisms, or marine species. The values could be socio, I mean, in general, in general socio-economic importance. So uh, the mission of the, uh, of this, uh, of the center is to promote uh, the, the recognition, sustainable utilization, and evaluation of the genetic resources inherent in the country. Uh, this will cover plants, animal, marine, microbes. And we have uh, three activities in this regard to promote, uh, conserve, and use. I'm, and I may, uh, I may, uh, what they call it, draw it in, uh, in this way that we, pro, uh, we promote uh, use, we promote conserve, and the, we promote use by conservation as well. So uh, this is the, what they call it, uh, uh, both way uh, mechanisms for, uh, for these activities. However, uh, for the plant genetic resources, uh, as uh, published, uh, there are about more than 1,400 species in the country. And, uh, but uh, there is very, uh, very low information uh, about the socioeconomic values of these plants, uh, their distribution in the country, and the status of the conservation, either in their ecosystem, in situ, or outside their ecosystem, ex situ. Uh, so what we did, uh, we have uh, records uh, to, to develop our checklist and uh, to get information. We have uh, what they call it, uh, information from the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, as well as from 
Oman um, Natural History Museum. Uh, we have about 15,000, uh, uh, what they call it, uh, data uh, for distributions and species list. And these uh, species were including uh, native species, naturalized aliens, frequently occurring casuals, and uh, crop weeds. So from, uh, from this uh, list of what we did, we, we match which, uh, which, which, is, which is which. And we can see that uh, we developed from this uh, different uh, uh, mining. Uh, we developed uh, uh, crops. We developed, uh, we developed list of the crop wild relatives. We developed list of medicinal plant, forestry, and ornamental species. And this is what we did. And from that, we, we got almost uh, 1,000 species from 1,400 species have socioeconomic uh, uh, importance. That means 70% of the plants in the country have socioeconomic importance. So, and from the, our analysis, we found that 100 almost is for food and agriculture, uh, 700 is for crop wide relatives. 440 uh, for medicinal plant, 180 uh, for, for forestry, and 285 for ornamental species. So, and so we did then, uh, that we got the, the distribution of these plants, we, digit, we digitized, some of them, some of them are really written, uh, but we then digitalized, uh, digitized, so for the, uh, what they call it, geographical information, uh, analysis to know the taxa richness, to know current prediction uh, of the plant taxa based on the edific and climatic data, and gap analysis for in situ and ex situ conservation. Uh, then we, from this uh, interpretation and, uh, and discussion, we published uh, a report, uh, a book uh, published in 2017, uh, for our findings. And of course, these were classified regarding, uh, according to their classes. Is it medicinal plant, crop wild relative, or crops, or other classes? For example, here, uh, for the medicinal plant, we can see that the richness of the, uh, of the, the, the richness, um, excuse me, the observation of the medicinal plant. So, uh, you can see that the missile plant is uh, distributed uh, very well through the country. However, there is some spots with the, with the dark uh, blue lag, and that means that there are about uh, 40 to 45 uh, observation in 2.5 square kilometer. Each, uh, each uh, square is 2.5 square kilometer, and of course, there is also abundance of these uh, missile plants observation in the southern country, in the far area. Then this is the taxa uh, richness, that means uh, the number of species, uh, species or taxa per square kilometer, you can see again that in the, the far region, the southern part of the far, as well as some part in the near to the Jabal Sarhan area, there is a higher reach of medicinal plant in that region, which reaching about to 30 species per square, uh, per 2.5 square kilometers, as well as same area in the uh, in the, uh, the Jabal Akhbar uh, area, and here um, uh, this map showing where is there is a, what they call it uh, uh, less collection for situ conservation. Of course, we depend on the on the data that we had from different organizations in the country, like from the Minister of Agriculture, from Oman Botanic Garden. So we have this uh, information and we impose, did we collect based on predicted distribution of, for example, of missile plant in the country, uh, what is, where is missing? So you can see that still we have a lot of red, which is mean that we have a lot of missing or gap need to be filled for collections of uh, a group of missile plant in this region. Also here in the far, uh, also the, the collections is, is missing a lot. And this is the in situ uh, or protected areas uh, published by our uh, by the government. So the, you can see the shed areas here and here and here in Jabal Akbar, 
and to other some island. And we, from, from our study, current study, we found that uh, there is need much more of protected area in the, in, the, in the southern part of the country because of the richness of uh, different uh, species that have socioeconomic importance, as well as nearer also to the uh, scenic, uh, the, in the Jabal Akhbar scenic area, protected area, as well as to the southern part of the, of the, uh, of Moscow. Then, um, then we can, we saw that there is, uh, from our estimation, there is uh, limited conservation, either in situ or ex situ. And of course, uh, we have impact of climate change, urbanization. Uh, we'll discuss this too in, in my following uh, slides. However, I will not discuss our exploitation because it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a known and of course of the time of overexploitation either for harvesting by, by, by communities might be in a non-sustainable way or even because of the overgrazing. Now let's start with the climate change. The climate change, uh, this is uh, uh, what they call it, uh, a predicted distribution of one of the medicinal plants, uh, Ariva javanica, in Arabic it may be called ray, aray, or ra. And you can see that in 2015, the distribution production, of course, we use a model, a climate, uh, climate change model that uh, suits our uh, environment, that the distribution of these plants currently uh, will be like uh, in this area in the orange, in the orange color. But however, after 30 years from now or 35 years from the, from the study, the, the distribution will be very low because of the low precipitation as well as uh, high temperature. If we take uh, the impact of uh, climate change on future uh, protected areas or reserve for conservation, you can see that in, in my uh, previous slides, we, we recommended a lot in the, in the southern part of, uh, of Oman, in the southern part of uh, the far region and some in the, in the north. But however, if we consider with the climate change, the picture will be different. This, the green spots here is for the current one with the current model. But if we take the, the 30 years from now, the, uh, there is much more of uh, what they call it uh, uh, reserved area or protected areas to be, to be established uh, for these spots because because we impact of the climate change. And this is of course done by, uh, with a colleague of, uh, as a proposal was, uh, was submitted by Dr. Maxted from University of Birmingham. Now let's talk about the urbanization. This study was uh, done with the uh, GIS and remote sensing center at Sultan Qaboos University. So we have here, uh, 40 years uh, areas uh, from, uh, we can see that this, the red line is for the building. So the building was almost uh, 1,000 uh, hectare in, in 1978, but after uh, 40 years, uh, it's reached uh, to 35, 30, uh, 3, 3,500 square uh, hectares. And uh, in the, from, from the vegetation uh, perspective, the, it was 60,000 hectares, and uh, this is only for the mountainous area, and uh, it was then reduced to almost uh, 40,000 hectares. That means that the, 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 the rare increasing of building almost 70% and decreasing of vegetation on the mountainous areas, uh, almost 30%. This, uh, this uh, map is uh, for the Bufar region, uh, يعني, uh, for the five uh, wilayats in, in Bufar. It's, uh, it's uh, superimposing uh, two maps. The, uh, the, the first map is the, with the green is for the vegetation. And it was taken in 1978. And the red uh, is the spot uh, for the buildings. Uh, uh, that uh, that is found in 2018. 
So you can see there, is, there are um, يعني, uh, red spots some here in the in this in the in the salala uh, as well as in the wilayat uh, uh, and but no in the Taqa and uh, and uh, Marba. What what we we found that uh, from this spot, this is this red spot of the buildings were impacted almost 100 species uh, from 1978 to 2018. However, from our uh, preliminary uh, analysis of these species, these species uh, were found in other locations within the far or even within the country. So we thought, I mean, we, we conclude, but still we should be, con we should be uh, confirmed this, that the, the building that till now Really, the urbanization, in fact, didn't impact um, uh, the genetic diversity of the uh, of the farm, and of course, this is, will be published later on. So, what is uh, the research? Uh, what the center is doing for conservation? So, uh, the center, in fact, uh, have two, uh, of course, two issues: uh, is working on uh, in situ conservation, but mostly on the exita i will describe this in, in, in other slide and uh, of course we share information uh, of uh, distribution of the hotspots and the plant species uh, to for example to other entities and government for example we share it to the uh, planning superior planning entity in the in the country we do of course research and of course we do also public awareness or communication to the public uh, this is the collection of medicinal plants since uh, late uh, October 2018 till August uh, till, till date August 2020. We we are three four uh, members. We collected about 33. We went to 33 sites from the northern part to the southern part. We collect about 77 medicinal plants uh, for 138 exceptions. These uh, will be, of course, we prepared uh, in collaboration with University of Nizwa, uh, Gene Bank, uh, that have a standard international uh, parameters for conservation as either for active or for long uh, conservation. Of course, we do also a database and information that is accessible through, uh, through, through the internet and uh, information of collected material as well as any information of research uh, to that collection or accessions will be published and uh, in this uh, in this database and uh, i have so this is what kind of research we are going to do uh, with the medicinal plan that we are collecting and this is the recommendation i think the recommendation were uh, were discussed earlier with the earlier speakers so uh, I think it might be just we need to have really uh, as, uh, develop uh, necessary legislation that is might be we are missing or what they call it enforcing the legislation that is uh, that is re, uh, that's there. And uh, this is a recommendation for Exito. And uh, because of the time, uh, thank you very much. Uh, my presentation is in. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ali, for this uh, great presentation. And uh, thanks for all the researchers in animal and plant genetic resource center in Oman uh, for all this effort. Uh, actually, uh, we need uh, to gather all, all the, in the region to have a socioeconomic map for the region, not only for Oman, but all, uh, but all for all the region. Uh, I think, I think that is available for all. Just we need uh, to have a platform to collect this data together and to have uh, one geographical map or socioeconomic map uh, for the plants or diversity in the, in the region. And this is, I think, uh, Dr. Tony and Dr. Taraya, one of the, of the coming tasks for the Arabian Blast Specialist Group in the region to have a platform to uh, identify and collect the data in order to be spread between, between the, uh, the scientists in the region. Thank you, Dr. Ali, for this great presentation. Uh, and we will... Uh, move to Dr. Shahina Avanfar. Uh, she will talk about the preservation culture heritage uh, through the plants in the, uh, uh, in the world. 
uh, and this presentation is a part of the heritage based in botany that uh, for documenting the, the Arabian heritage in the region. Uh, Dr. Shahina, please. Uh, my. Uh, thank you, Ahmed. I'm trying to get a hold of my um, my presentation. Actually, I'm just going to share it. Uh, and I'm not not actually being able to do that over here for some reason. Yeah, what, what, what do you need um, um, just to click the share screen? Yeah, I, I, yeah but um, <laughs> it's, uh, uh, I'm not able to do that for some reason. Uh, um, I think I think if, if you uh, you can um, if you restart your computer, for example, or go out and you will able to do, and we can go with uh, Dr. Sufi until until you yeah okay we can come with you okay okay so we will uh, we'll uh, we'll okay I've got Sufi. it you got it okay so Dr. Shane how will the present can you see it uh, yes yes it is clear now. Please go ahead, Dr. Shane. Uh, it's, uh, I need to go full you screen. You can enlarge it, yes. And, then. and uh, okay, so um, thank you, thank you, uh, Ahmed and uh, the, the APSG group. I'm really very glad and uh, I bid um, salam alaikum to everyone. Very glad to be here. So I'm just going to talk very shortly about preserving culture, a so, so sort of a culture that is associated with natural habitats and with certain plants. As we lose our natural habitats and we lose our plants, we are also losing a certain cultural history that is, that is associated with it. Uh, because of the lack of time, I will only take uh, a couple of plants to give you some sort of an idea of what I'm talking about. But before that, uh, uh, through, through my research and through uh, other people's uh, research and data, what, we, what I have done is collated now uh, the kind of plants that are of medicinal and other purposes for the whole of the Arabian Peninsula. So just very briefly, there are health tonics, plants that are used for fertility, childbirth, pre and postnatal care, mostly for muscular and swollen joints. Arthritis sort of kind of comes in it. If you sprain your leg or you sprain your ankle, that also comes within that. And helminthic, if you have digestive problems that just don't go away and people realize that they may have worms, all comes under that. Diuretic and urinary problems, cold, cough, fever, headache. Normally in, um, in research, I've seen that people do put it all together. If you have a headache, you, you more or less eat the similar uh, preparations made from plants. If you have fever or cough or cold, uh, very, very similar. Uh, preparations are used. And then there's a whole bunch of 30 plants that are used as carminatives, laxatives, and antidiarrheals. All of them, again, together, used for one or the other, or basically to subside anything that's, that's causing a problem in your digestive system. But most importantly, and most quite surprisingly, what I came across was the most of the plants, or the uh, highest number of plants, were used for skin burns, bruises, stings, bites. And that is perhaps not surprising, living in such a climate as, uh, as in the Arabian Peninsula. Su sunburns, people, you know, sand, scorpions, bees, whatever. And there are lots, of, lots and lots of plants that are used for that purpose. Now, I just want to uh, uh, give one a painting, an exhibition of one painting, which is being taken from the British Museum. It's quite a famous painting about the legend of Bilqis, or the Queen of Sheba, which we are all aware of. And she sent uh, a note to King Solomon. And here is a representation. It's been done in Iran in um, sort of the 16th century, late. And all what, one of the things that they have done is basically shown a lot of flowers and plants on it. And each plant is associated with something which the painting is talking about. For Acer, under which Sheba is reclining, is constraint. Iris, which is uh, at the back, shows faith and wisdom and friendship. The hollyhock, Elsia, 
is ambition. The acacia plant, which is shown on one, one side, is basically platonic love. It's a concealed love or a secret love. I just wanted to put this that in in, in our culture, uh, not just the Arab culture, but it extends way into, uh, well, I think in the East and in the West as well, plants are always, or some plants are always associated with some form of culture, some sort of form of feelings. Uh, I'm just putting this slide up just to show that not always paintings are accurate. And this is taken from the National Gallery in Edinburgh. Uh, it's a painting which has been done by Raphael, a very famous uh, Italian, po uh, Italian artist in the 15th, 16th century. And it shows the Holy Family, the family of uh, 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 Mary with, with Jesus and with uh, Joseph. But have a look at the, at the tree which has been made. Now we know that this took place, if there's a birth of Jesus and this whole, um, uh, it took place in, in the area which is now Israel and you don't get the Washingtonia or the fan palms over there. It is mostly the date palms. So there is an interpretation of paintings which is not quite correct. I went around quite a lot of the art galleries to see, you know, because there are loads of paintings in major art galleries about, the, about Mary and Jesus uh, uh, in the childhood and whatever, and just to see the accuracy of the plants that are, that are in there. So, Correct association with correct plants is most important. So this is another association that we have uh, in, in, in our culture. This has been taken one from Mehmet Pasha Mosque. Uh, and this is mostly, I think both of them are from Turkey. The motif of palm on gravestones. It is believed that, you know, because the palm is such a majestic tree, the date palm, it is believed that if you have the palm tree, you will reach uh, a very high uh, level of rest or, or paradise. Uh, it's a simply signification, it's just a signifying something for the dead, basically just another association that we have uh, with the palm tree, with the dead palm. And of course they are on um, a lot of coins. The first one, which apparently is, is quite quite old, only 750 AD, uh, which was minted at uh, Ramla in Palestine, and that shows a palm tree on it. So I'm going to talk about two plants. The first one is uh, found in Oman. I have not seen it elsewhere, but this is found in Oman called Safarjal or Safargal. Now Safargal, if you look under the dictionary, it's quince. It is the Arabic, classic Arabic name for quince. And quince is a plant which is found in northern uh, sort of Afghanistan, Iran, um, cent Soviet Central Asia, Kyrgyzstan area. So that is where is the natural or the native habitat for quince. It's also known as Palestinian sweet lime or the Indian sweet lime. The, the botanical name is Lamatoides. And it is believed to be a hybrid between Citrus Medica and another hybrid of Mandarin and Pomelo. So it's a very sweet orange and people who live in Oman probably know it when the time comes. There are street sellers or people who sit around somewhere between on the Nizwa road selling Safar gel. Safar gel is something which is like an orange, a very sweet orange, but it does have for the local Omani that it's it is used as a health tonic. And it is liked a lot by the people. Uh, I haven't seen it being sold in the market, but it's possible that now it is sold in Nizwa or so on. But what I want to illustrate over there that even though the wrong, the name is used, Safagal, we have to understand and associate this plant with tonic. It is not quince. So it is very, very important to have some, um, first of all, the historical, the value of this plant of uh, Safargel or Safargel, and secondly, the value of the, the language that is associated with it as well. The second plant is uh, called Vars, and I've been looking at Vars because, well, there, there's a chapter in the book with that, that, that uh, is on nature and language. And I looked at Vars uh, 
which is Flamingia gramania, gramaniana of the family Fabaceae. It's basically the pods which have glandular hairs. They have become, they're very red and when they dry, they're crushed, sieved, and they are used basically as a dye. They used, they were, it was very common. They were used uh, as, a, as a dye to dye cloth. Uh, during the Muslim era, it was a lot of wars was uh, cultivated from Yemen and from North Africa. And it was sent to Sicily to dye silk, which was, you know, it has a very beautiful orangish dye. But uh, with with the with the waning of the of the Muslim civilization, this and also finding new uh, uh, cosmetic or uh, dyeing agents, this has waned down. But it was very much there earlier on. So, worse in Oman is used to color the body yellow for you know it's used for celebrations. The painting down here, I think, uh, which I'm pointing to, if you can see it. This is just uh, something which I took from Wikipedia, uh, from the images, and it's a painting. It's not actually uh, a, a photograph because it's very difficult to photograph women, especially in the central region of Jadat al Harasis, where this particular plant is used as a mixture or a yellow uh, face covering intensively. And you can see the, the painting, it shows a very yellow face to the, to the girl. The second one, uh, uh, is, is a photograph from somebody in Ethiopia. So it is used very commonly in Ethiopia, in the Hadramaut region of Yemen, and in uh, the Jeddah al Harasis, and in Dofar, in Oman. I do not know if anything like that is used in other parts um, of, of the Arabian Peninsula. But the virus has had several other names because it was quite difficult. It is a very rare plant. It is uh, almost not found anymore in Yemen. It used to be present in Yemen and used over there, uh, but now it is almost um, almost gone, or possibly because coffee planting and cut planting started to happen. I did um, contact while I was working on this. I did contact quite a number of local. Yemeni uh, botanists, including uh, who may even be with us, uh, Wali Al Khaledi, and uh, he said it is very rare. In fact, he hadn't seen it. So this is another plant which needs some sort of uh, conservation. Definitely not necessarily because it's a it's a, it's a plant which is which we can do without possibly because. Worse can still come from other parts of the world, but this has got a, a culture or an association which is has been there for an extremely long time, even before the beginning of Islam. The word the word waris is now also used in Saudi Arabia at the stage of flowering, as just when the flowers uh, the anthers start to produce. Maybe because it's got the similarity and the color is very yellow. Um, it has been used in pre-Islamic Arab poetry, the, the word worse. It was um, into Ethiopian Semitic languages in Harari as Warsi. It is called Waris in Somali. It is basically deeply incorporated into the Arabic morphology. And of course, various verbal and nominal derivatives have found around this word. So waris is a, is a garment dyed, dyed with waris. Warasa to dye with waris. Warasa is to put forth waris. Um, it is very important, therefore, I feel that to, to, to um, not just the culture, but the plant should be, that is associated with it, can be conserved or should be conserved. It is very rare in Yemen, if uh, uh, there, and Possibly it can be reintroduced, but the people over there do now get it much from Ethiopia. So preserving, I mean, as we have heard from uh, Dr. Ali uh, and also from uh, Dr. Ihab, that global climate change is here upon us. There is human impact on the environment. The natural habitats of many plant communities and animals are being lost or have changed as uh, Dr. Ali uh, showed it in his model. Many species will or they cannot 
can no longer live in the nature areas of distribution. But a loss of species means that there is a loss of history and culture that is associated with it in its native environment. It's very, very important to document them and try to conserve these areas where there is a history uh, attached. Plants can always be cultivated. I can take worse, I can plant it over here in my garden in, uh, in Cambridge, but I will not know the culture associated with it or somebody else who looks at this plant will, will completely be lost as it was in its native habitat. So this is my um, take on this, which is one of our um, GSPC, uh, uh, how should I say, uh, targets as well, is to preserve those plants which have a cultural history associated with it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Shahina, for this uh, great topic. And uh, really, we need to, uh, for this kind of project, for uh, to preserve the culture based on plants such as worse, as you mentioned, and spiritual, and all of these plants that may be extinct uh, right now for, for the, at their original habitats. Although some uh, uh, the worst presented in Somalia or or, uh, or other countries, but I think uh, with the current situation right now in uh, in Yemen, uh, it is very difficult to find the the, the worst plant uh, at the region. And we really hope to to work with uh, to, to an order as a part of the botanic garden to uh, to bring the plants and propagate and increase the number of the plants at least. Uh, at this uh, at this time, uh, I think was one of the the main plant for the Quran Botanic Garden, where it is mentioned in the Hadith, as you mentioned, as a part of dye for for the face and, and something like this. Uh, and one of the also the historical uh, many uh, many stories behind behind the words. Uh, I think the even plant specialists who with the Quran Botanic Garden and all the and all the country of the region. Uh, insist to preserve the plants and preserve the heritage was based on the plants such, uh, such as those kind of species. Thank you, Dr. Shahina, for this great topic. And Thank we you. will move uh, to Dr. Sufi Neil, the head of the Center of Middle uh, Eastern Plants, uh, Royal Botanic Garden, Edinburgh, and she will talk uh, uh, on identification uh, of the priority of uh, areas for conservation in Arabia. Oman important uh, plant area IPA network. Dr. Sophie, please. Uh. Hi, good afternoon. Um, can everyone see my screen okay? Yeah, your, your screen is working. Um, so many thanks to the organizers for arranging this webinar and for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Um, I've, um, my aim is to talk about important plant areas and um, work which has been done to identify a network of these sites in Oman. So we're facing a global biodiversity crisis. Plant species and habitats are being lost an, at an unprecedented rate. One in five plant species is threatened with extinction. And as Hatem mentioned earlier, recent IU, IUCN Red List work in the Arabian region has shown that sadly threats to plants here are very much in keeping with this global trend. So to help combat this, we must prioritize our conservation efforts. We need to urgently and systematically ask, where are the most important places for plant diversity in Arabia? And then we need to make sure that these are effectively conserved and protected. This idea is reflected in the Global Strategy for Plant Conservation in Target 5. Um, we've already heard this discussed um, various times this afternoon. Um, but the IPA approach is a tried and tested way of doing the first part of this, which is identifying where these sites are. So the approach was developed by Plant Life International and the criteria for important plant areas first published in 2001. It's since been used extensively, particularly across Europe, the Middle East and Africa. Um, in the Middle East, this includes a publication identifying IPAs in, in the Mediterranean areas, um, a significant work in Lebanon and a long-term program by the Saudi Wildlife Authority. Um, there's now a number of other national IPA programs um, being developed um, in Arabia. So the identification of IPAs is based on three basic criteria. Criteria A, which is threatened species. The goal of this being to capture places which contain species under the threat of extinction. Criteria B, which looks at botanical richness. 
um, the aim being to capture places of exceptional plant or fungal diversity and it focuses on quality of sites rather than threat and criteria C which aims to capture the, the largest and most continuous areas of threatened or extremely restricted habitats. So a place can qualify as an important plant area if it meets one or more of these criteria. So I'd like to talk um, a bit more about how these criteria have been used to identify a network of sites in Oman. Um, the work was undertaken as part of a large government project, Oman's National Spatial Strategy, the ONSS project, which is a, is a large wide ranging project aimed at guiding long term development um, spatially in the country. So one of the major elements um, of this is better environmental protection. So IPAs were considered to be a really appropriate mechanism to input data on priority sites into this um, project. And it was really interesting hearing D Dr. Lawati talk earlier about uh, protected areas in Oman. I think you will find this interesting. So the outcome has been uh, 43 sites, um, which have now been designated as important plant areas in Oman. So this is a great example of um, systematically applying the criteria uh, across a country um, to identify a, a network of sites. So a, a, an Arabian specific set of IPA criteria is in fact developed um, by the Arabian Plant Specialist Group uh, way back in 2010. At the time, this reflected um, limited data on plant distributions and a lack of um, red list assessments um, being available. But um, recent advance, advances um, meant that in this case of the work in Oman, we were able to take a more empirical approach um, to the criteria. And we used a recently revised set uh, published in 2017, this, this paper up here uh, by Derbyshire et al. So the process of identifying sites in Oman was guided by a number of workshops with the ONSS team. Um, this is a picture of one of the workshops here, um, as well as, um, botanical partners at the Oman Botanic Garden and um, many other Omani environmental stakeholders. Um, but really significant to the, to the success of this project has been the work of the Oman Botanic Garden. They've had an extremely active fieldwork program over a number of years, which has seen a huge increase in experience and knowledge of the flora, including um, at least 20 species new to science and, and a lot of significant new records for the country. So this data was really important um, in being able to assess this IPA network. So returning to the criteria, which I've already discussed, um, it's beyond the scope and the time limit of this talk to go into any technical detail. Um, but under each of these criteria, there are a number of sub criteria and threshold levels which provide the detail of how you actually go about assessing if a place qualifies for as an IPA. Um, if you if you're interested in it and you want to find out more, I would highly recommend starting with the Derbyshire paper that I mentioned um, earlier. But in Oman, we went through each of these criteria and sub criteria in turn. Um, so, for example, for the threatened species. Um, we collated all of the available published and peer reviewed unpublished distribution information and then used to assess when sites qualified as IPAs. Um, we were only able to do this because of all the red listing work that's been done in Oman and recently at the um, Sharjah conference. Um, but using this, we were able to ensure that the network was comprehensive in its coverage of Oman's threatened flora. For criteria B, looking at botanical richness, um, we went back to basics and we developed a nationally agreed list of vegetation types for Oman and we did some very basic vegetation mapping and this meant that we ensured um, that we agreed and discussed and included the best agreed examples of each of Oman's vegetation types within the network. And for threatened habitats um, as part of the project again we developed a draft agreed list of vegetation types which were um, assessed as being threatened either globally, regionally or nationally and um, we included these um, vegetation types into the network according to the to the published IPA criteria. So that's a bit of a whirlwind um, show of how we approach this, but we ended up with a network of 43 sites which are qualify and are now listed as um, important plant areas in Oman. And for each of these sites, there exists a technical listing which shows the criteria by which they qualify um, the vegetation types and um, the species which are found in them. So the, the IPA network has um, uh, been done as part of this government project, will be, but will be published as an academic paper um, shortly. 
I'd just like to finish um, with a slide which just reiterates and highlights some of the key features which I think are really important um, for important plant areas. Firstly, that the criteria which are used are clear, they're simple, but they're scientifically robust. They're tried and tested, they work for plants. But the process is also pragmatic and reflects um, a variation in the amount and quality of plant data available in different places. So um, finally, the process needs to be underpinned um, by engagement with local and national stakeholders um, with a view to the, the successful long term management and conservation of these sites. And um, that's it. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Dr. Sophie, for this brief uh, presentation and uh, very concise presentation. Uh, actually, for uh, 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 right now, all the researchers in the region are collecting that, uh, but we have um, a main problem that uh, we, didn't, we didn't have a certain criteria for data collection. Uh, we might we might collecting data for important plant areas, but uh, we didn't include it with the program of the important plant areas. Uh, uh, of this, uh, but if we, if we can throw the Arabian plant specialist group in the, in the in the near future to identify and unify the, the data collection with which project Dr. Dr. Uh, Ali talked about about the socioeconomics and the same data collected for IBA and the same data collected for the red listing. If we uh, throw the the new group or the revival of the Arabian plant specialist group with the, all the experts and stakeholders in the region we can identify and recreate uh, those kind of projects again uh, in the region. Thank you, Dr. Sophie, for this great presentation. And now we will talk about the uh, taxonomic problems uh, for the genus and the species in the region. It's not an easy task, but it is, it is one of the main pillar of the global strategy, uh, conservation strategy. And Dr. Azazi uh, is one of the experts Plant Genetic Resource Expert, Department of Agricultural Research in the Ministry and Municipality in Qatar. So we'll talk about this issue and uh, the plant taxonomic problems and species identification, especially in the ecological surveys and seed collection. Dr. Azazi, please go ahead. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, good, after, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Ahmed, do you see the, my presentation or not yet? Uh, you start sharing and this is she's, it's coming. Sharing already, huh? Not yet. Yeah, this is already, yeah. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, today, uh, my talk about uh, taxonomic problems of uh, Arabian flora. And I will speak in Arabic, so if anyone uh, can change the uh, channel for translation to English. Uh, so, uh, so the speakers, if you need to listen, and, and, Yes. In English, yes. please change it into English from the interpretation. كما نعلم جميعا أن العلاقة بين Can you use the original audio? Okay. العلاقة بين الإنسان والنباتات أو الفلورة بشكل عام مرتبطة ارتباط وثيق. منذ Yes, I try to mute it. نعم نعم اسمع لك اوكي 
I try to open the main. I don't know where the mute, I see it before, mute, okay. Okay, no problem, I'll speak, it's okay. Okay, the relationship between the human and the plant علاقة قديمة العلاقة دي بتعتمد على تمية النباتات واهتمام الإنسان إن هو كان يتعرف على النباتات اللي يستطيع يتغذى على هذه النباتات فكان لابد إن هو يتعرف على جودة النباتات دي ومدى صلاحيتها لعملية الأكل بناء عليه ظهر ما يسمى التراديشنال كلاسيفيكيشن او التراديشنال تاكسونومي او التصنيف التقليدي للنباتات. من الاهداف المهمه اللي بيسعى اليها علم التصنيف ان هو يحاول يجمع الانواع النباتيه القريبه من بعضها في مجموعات متشابهه وعائلات متشابهه عشان يسهل استخدامها من قبل الباحثين والعلماء. الأهداف العامة لعلم التصنيف توجد أهداف كثيرة لكن أهم ثلاثة أهداف في عملية التشخيص ودي تهتم إن إحنا نعرف من خلالها ماهية الأنواع النباتية أو الأنواع النباتية اللي عندي الحاجة الثانية التسمية العلمية ودي بتعطي الاسم العلمي للنبات إذا كان نبات جديد وده بيكون وفقاً للقواعد الدولية لتسمية النباتات. ال ال الهدف الثالث اللي هو التصنيف أو التقسيم وده ال الهدف اللي بيقوم بنظام أو إعداد وتجميع الأنواع النباتية القريبة من بعضها في كاتاجرز أو مجموعة تصنيفية أو مراتب تصنيفية قريبة مثل الفاميلي، الجينس، العائلة، الجنس، النوع وده بيستفيد منه باقي العلماء. طبعا علم التصنيف له علاقه ببقيه العلوم علم الفسيولوجي النبات علم الخليه علم الاناتومي علم الجيناتكس علم البولين او علم حبوب اللقاح علم التشريح معظم العلوم بترتبط بعمليه التصنيف النبات طبعا تصنيف النبات من العمليات الهامه جدا لإن بدون تصنيف صحيح هيكون في عندي خطأ في التصنيف النوع النبات اللي عندي وبناء عليه بتستمر عملية الأخطاء في أشياء أخرى. طبعا الخبرة التصنيفية من المشاكل الكبيرة جدا اللي بتواجه المنطقة العربية وبشكل خاص لو بتكلم على دولة قطر في عندنا نقص في أعداد مصنفي النبات أو المهتمين بعملية تصنيف النبات بشكل أساسي. الخطا اللي بيحصل في حاله عدم وجود مصنفين جيدين بيترتب عليه اخطاء كثيره جدا. طبعا على الرغم من التقدم السريع في التقنيات الجزيئيه اللي هي البايتنولوجي او المولوكلر لكن ما زال عمليه التصنيف التقليدي او الكلاسيكي ان الواحد يتعرف على الانواع النباتيه من خلال شكل المورفولوجي وشكل الازهار والبذور ومكونات النبات بشكل عام ما زالت من العمليات الهامه والاساسيه. طبعا الدور الاساسي لخبراء التصنيف ان هم بيعملوا عمليه توصيف وتوفير الاسماء العلميه لباقي العلماء والخدمه دي بيحتاجها المهتمين بالمهندسين، المهتمين بعمليه الايكولوجيكال سيرفي، الانفيرمنتال امباكت اسسمنت، كل العمليات المرتبطه بالانواع النباتيه بشكل عام. عملية إذا حصل خطأ أو فشل في تحديد الكائن الحي أو النوع النباتي بشكل صحيح بناء عليه بيكون في استنتاجات زائفة في نهاية المطاف أو في نهاية العملية أو نهاية البحث ولذلك عشان يتم التصنيف الأنواع النباتية بشكل صحيح لازم يكون عندنا معرفة بالأنواع اللي موجودة داخل 
المنطقة أو الأريا اللي احنا هنشتغل عليها معرفة الأنواع الزهرية مع الأزهار المتاحة وتوزيعها على البيئات المختلفة وده بيكون من خلال المراجع والأبحاث العلمية المنشورة في الدولة أو في المنطقة اللي بنشتغل عليها الحاجة الثانية التصنيف التقليدي بعد ما أعمل عملية السيرفي الأولانية أو المسح المبدئي ببدأ أعمل عملية التصنيف التقليدي إن أنا بخرج وأصنف الأنواع النباتية اللي عندي طبقا للشكل المورفولوجي ومكونات النبات. الشيء الآخر الحديث إنه هو استخدام المولوكلر كاركترزيشن أو البايوتكنولوجي تولز ودي بتستخدم في عملية توصيف الأنواع النباتية وتفرقتها عن بعضها ودي من الأشياء الحديثة اللي بتستخدم. والتصنيف باستخدام التقنية الحيوية تطور تطور كبير جدا وأصبحت في طرق عديدة للتفريقة أو توصيف أو تقسيم النباتات باستخدام الـ DNA باستخدام الـ RNA طرق مختلفة يعني. لكن للأسف الشديد ما زالت عملية التقسيم أو التصنيف النباتي تقييمها قليل في عملية التحليلات العلمية المختلفة وده نتيجة لضعف التمويل اللي بيوجه لعملية التاكسونومي في منطقتنا ولذلك تحتاج عملية التصنيف دفع أو زيادة ضخ الاموال لابحاث التصنيف. طبعا عمليه التصنيف الانواع النباتيه بيكون لها مصادر رئيسيه اقدر اصنف من خلالها النباتات اللي عندي، في عندي الشكل المورفولوجي وده الشكل الاساسي اللي معظم الناس بتتعرف على النباتات من خلالها، في علم الاناتومي او التشريح بتاع النبات وده بي بيديني برضو دليل على تصنيف النوع النبات اللي عندي بعض الاجزاء بتاعت النباتات. في عندي الدليل الفسيولوجي النبات الشكل المختلف بتاع الجزء الخلوي بتاع النبات اللي عندي. هنتطرق بشكل سريع لدوله قطر. احنا في بدايه انشاء البنك الوراثي او بدايه عمل البنك الوراثي في 2012 واجهتنا المشكله ازاي نصنف الالوان النباتيه خاصه ان احنا ما عندناش متخصصين في التصنيف بشكل كبير الفريق اللي موجود محتاجين نعمل له عمليه دفع قوي عشان يقدر يكون عنده الباك جراوند او اساسيات العلميه لتصنيف الانواع النباتيه وبناء عليه عقدنا العديد من الدورات التدريبيه هنتكلم عنها بشكل سريع في الشرائح اللي جايه لكن البنك الوراثي في دوله قطر حاليا موجود عندنا يعني اولموست تقريبا 700 عينه نباتيه داخل البنك الوراثي عينه بذريه من الانواع النباتيه الموجوده البريه في دوله قطر اكسيشنز عندنا 750 هربريوم سامبل او هربريوم اكسيشنز يعني بتضم في ضعبتها 3500 عينه نباتيه كامله التصنيف ومحفوظة بشكل جيد جدا في الدواليب الخاصة بعملية المعشبة. طبعا في نفس الوقت نجمع عينات المادة الوراثية أو الدي إن إيه عشان نستطيع نؤكد تصنيف وتوصيف الموارد الوراثية اللي بنجمعها داخل البنك. فعندنا 750 نوع أو 750 أكسيشن <تصفيق> عفوا 750 أكسيشن داخل وحدات الحفظ كمادة وراثية مستخلصة دي إن إيه. طبعا الفلورا في دوله قطر تقريبا في حدود 400 450 نوع نباتي اجمالا لا تتعدى 300 نوع نباتي بري فده من ضمن الحاجات اللي بتساعد على عمليه يعني تيسير عمليه التوصيف خاصه للمهتمين بعمليه الدراسات البيئيه. طبعا من ضمن الدورات التدريبيه اللي قمنا بتنفيذها بالتعاون مع الجهات الخارجيه لتدريب الفريق الذي يعمل في البنك الوراثي وبعض المنتسب جامعه قطر ومنتسب وزاره البلديه والبيئه عملنا دورتين تدريبيتين في هذا الاطار الدوره التدريبيه الاولى بالتصنيف التقليدي الاساس العلمي للتصنيف التقليدي للمعشبات وده تم في سبع سبعه ايام وكان فيها من 20 ل 25 منتسب وتم تدريبهم على جميع المراحل اللي بيتم من خلالها توصيف وتجميع العينات النباتيه للمعشبه والبنك الوراثي. الدوره التدريبيه الثانيه اللي قمنا بتنفيذها بالتعاون مع الحديقه النباتيه الملكيه 
في أدنبرا وكيو في إنجلترا في لندن دورة تدريبية متخصصة عن التوصيف الفوتوغرافي الدقيق للأنواع النباتية والتوصيف الفوتوغرافي الدقيق ده بيدينا مواصفات هامة لكل الأجزاء النباتية اللي نقدر نصورها إذا كانت الأزهار المحتويات الداخلية بتاعت الأزهار السبلات البتلات حبوب اللقاح المبيض الورقة أشكال الورقة المختلفة الفرع بتاع النبات شكل النبات بشكل كامل المحتويات الخارجية أو الزغب اللي بيكون موجود على النباتات توصيف دقيق شامل باستخدام الكاميرات عالية الدقة وبعض التقنيات أو الطرق لتوصيف الأنواع النباتية ودي تمت بشكل جيد جدا واصبح حاليا نجحنا في توصيف 100 نوع نباتي 100 نوع نباتي من الانواع النباتيه الموجوده في دوله قطر وسيصدر كتاب عن قريب يحتوي المجموعه النباتيه دي بتوصيفها الدقيق بتوصيف البيئات بتاعتها. الدوره الثانيه اللي هي الاساسيات التوصيف او الاساس العلمي للتوصيف العينات المحشبيه ودي تم تنفيذها بالتعاون مع المنظمه العربيه للتنميه الزراعيه وتمت لمنتسبي وزاره البلديه والبيئه وحضره القران الكريم ومنتسبي جامعه قطر في صور لبعض عمليه التوصيف الدقيق وتدريب الفريق القطري والفريق الذي يعمل في البنك الوراثي بشكل اساسي على توصيف الانواع النباتيه المختلفه من بعض الحاجات اللي احنا اشتغلنا عليها كمشاكل تصنيفية في دولة قطر عندنا نبات الأكاسيا إهرنبرجيانا أو نبات السلم في اللغة العربية النبات ده واجهتنا فيه مشكلة إن توجد بعض المكونات داخل الأزهار والبذور والأوراق تختلف من بعض الأشجار إلى أشجار أخرى ومن خلال المهتمين أو الهواة داخل دولة قطر أفادوا أن في نوع ما يسمى الاسم الشائع الشبهان وتم دراسة وتوصيف جميع الأجزاء اللي موجودة في النبات اللي هو السلم الأكاشيا إهرينبرجيانا الأوراق الأشواك اللي موجودة البراعم الزهرية النورة كاملة السمار البذور المكونات الداخلية للزهرة اللي اللي وجدناه اختلاف بين الاثنين بين الشبهان او السلم السلم القرون بتاعته اقل طولا من السلم من السلم الشبهان قرونه اطول البذور بتختلف في الحجم في اختلاف في لون المبيض وبعض الاجزاء الزهريه على يدنا الشمال لو لاحظتوه في العرض فاتجهنا الى اتجاه اخر وده اللي اشتغلنا عليه حاليا في التقنيه الحيويه احنا عملنا توصيف مورفولوجي مولوكولار كاركترايزيشن او توصيف وراثي للنبات السلم والشبهان ولكن افادت النتائج ان الاثنين نفس الجينوس اللي هو اكاشيا هيمبرجيانا مع بعض الاختلافات البيئيه دي قد تكون ناتجه من الظروف البيئيه المحيطه بالتلقيح الخلطي حتى الان ما زال البحث لم لم يعني لم نطرح البحث بشكل او لم ننشر البحث بشكل علمي لكن ما زلنا شغالين عليه وبنعيد التجربه الخاصه بالتوصيف الوراثي. برضه من ضمن العمليات اللي استخدمناها للتاكد من التوصيف او المشاكل التصنيفيه لبعض الانواع النباتيه التي قد تنتج نتيجه تحورات او طفرات نتيجه الظروف البيئيه عندنا نبات الكبارس سباينوزا اللي هو الشفلح النبات ده وجدنا في في احدى الرحلات التجميعيه وجدنا الساق متحور تماما بياخد شكل يعني مبطط مختلفه شكل الاوراق فقمنا باجراء الدراسه الدراسه الجينيه او المولوكولار كاركترايزيشن وبينت ان هو نفس النوع لكن حصل تطفره نتيجه بعض الظروف البيئيه وبعض المحيطه بالنبات. بشكل عام ده نظرا لضيق الوقت يعني ده بشكل عام البرزنتيشن اللي بيتعلق بالمشاكل التصنيفيه في الفلوره. 
شكراً جزيلاً للاستماع. شكراً جزيلاً دكتور عزيز ثانك يو دكتور عزيز for this important topic which is taxonomic problems not easy at all and it is very difficult to identify the species right now and most of most of the and and as you mentioned there is a big shortage in the taxonomists in the world and most of the people right now are going for the molecular biology and dna however the molecular biology uh, uh, depends on the uh, classic taxonomy impossible to to identify the plant species without a main sample identified before by uh, by someone and this is uh, one of the challenges in the region that most of the people even the seed banks right now they are uh, mixing between the the species inside the genus itself uh, for example this is one of the major uh, uh, problem that facing not only here but in the region and in the world as well. Uh, thank, thank you for all speakers today, uh, for all this great, these great topics. And uh, we have uh, here, uh, uh, Dr. Tony, uh, if you want to, to give, uh, um, uh, uh, as long as we are talking about the Arabian Brand Specialist Group priorities for the coming, uh, for the coming five years or three years, uh, with uh, the end of the global strategy of the uh, plant conservation 2020. Uh, I think uh, you have uh, some uh, in the group, in the Arabian Plant Specialist Group, some priorities to start in the region uh, as soon as possible. If, if you want to represent this, you will be more than welcome. Okay, can you see that slide? Yeah, we see the slide. Okay, though, so this is just a very, I'm aware that we're really running out of time. So this is just one slide, a very brief um, summary. All right, let's just, yeah, so um, it's been great. So we've heard a lot about the work which has been going on in the region, a series of really fascinating talks. So we see what's been achieved but we can also see that still a lot needs to be done. And so really, what I really wanted to talk about, just one or two thoughts I had on the way forward. So clearly the idea of the Arabian Plant Specialist Group is to build a network of people and organizations. So this is one of the, the clear priorities. Um, we need to improve and catalyze collaboration and raise awareness of initiatives regionally. <clears throat> I mean, it's interesting today that there are various things going on that I wasn't aware of um, within the region just, just from this talk today. So, I mean, that again <clears throat> is a very important aspect. Um, <clears throat> we also need to identify gaps in data, um, activity, knowledge and skills. Um, at the moment, we really don't have, there's no central data. There's lots of data distributed all over the region, different databases. Uh, there are activities going on. There's little sharing of knowledge, little sharing of skills. So this is the sort of thing that we need to be able to start collaborating on and to help us to develop long-term action plans for the Raven Plant Specialist Group. Um, <clears throat> certainly one of the ideas, I think my idea or our idea initially at least would be to, <coughs> excuse me, excuse me, <coughs> would to be prepare a questionnaire the idea being really to try and establish the status of what's going on in the region. So we, we need to know to collate information on the projects, data sets which exist regionally. Um, we can then make this information available in a detailed publication and that, that can be used to inform engaged researchers, policymakers. And so the idea of a, of a document like this is something that we always spoke about with the older Arabian Plant Specialist Group was a way of attracting funds, a way of attracting interest from decision makers by producing an information pack, but fairly glossy sort of attractive publication, which would summarize what's been going on in the region, what needs doing, and the way that the Raven Plant Specialist Group might help fill those gaps. Um, it would also be an opportunity to celebrate Arabian plant diversity. I think we've seen from some of the talks going on with things about the cultural heritage, particularly, um, are absolutely fascinating and probably a little known about how to collaborate to um, 
get an idea of best practice in research and conservation. We're dealing with a number of countries here, each with independent projects, programs. There's a lot to be learned from each other. So I think we raise the work profile being done across the, the region as well. So that's a few of my ideas, but I'm, as I say, I'm aware that we're really running out of time. So I think it would be useful to hear any, any thoughts or questions from other people um, as, as any comments about the new Arabian Plant Specialist Group and ideas how we might go forward to and about go about reaching its new goals. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Dr. Tony. And I think I think as Dr. John Ball mentioned that the West Asia is represented only with one one percent only from the experts in the, in the region. And also, Dr. Domitilla mentioned that the Plant uh, Conservation Committee there is a great project with the Plant Conservation um, Conservation Committee. Why not if they can extend the, the, the region, the Arabian, the Arabian Peninsula region to this, to this committee it will help to identify that, that there is a great project in Oman, there is a great project here where in, in, in Edinburgh uh, and, and in Jordan as, a, um, as well and in Qatar. So why not if the, we can link all of this under, under one project? I don't, but the main problem that we are facing now that we are collecting data, but we are collecting data for collecting data, uh, not, not, not for a certain project. So if we have if we have a certain name that, for example, IPA, important area, uh, plant area, for example. So we are we know that we are collecting to serve this with criteria of this. The same the same data will be used for the ICM red list. The same data will be used for the socioeconomic and the documenting heritage, as Dr. Shahina mentioned. We need an urgent platform for the region in order to to collect all of this data in between the stakeholders in Qatar. In, 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 all, in Oman, in Kuwait, in all the region, in order to collect one, one platform uh, under this, uh, uh, under, under certain projects in order to update the international or the regional, uh, the regional projects, link it together. But unfortunately, we are working in the separate areas and separate circles. So if we can, if the Arabian Plant Specialist Group uh, uh, able to have this platform through the Species Survival Committee, in collaboration with the Quran Botanic Garden, for example, and other, other botanic gardens or other centers of authorities in the region, will be great start in order to document all of these projects. Because uh, from my point of view, we are collecting, yes, we are collecting data, but there is no a real uh, or a clear work uh, or a project or a joint project between, between the countries in the region. This is my, this is my question. Doctor. Dr. Soraya, if anybody needs to add something, yeah, please. Um, if I could say something, something. I, I think certainly um, there's a lot of very interesting programs going on with restoration work within the region, both on um, ecological restoration and urban restoration with a huge number of massive urbanization programs and development projects across the region. The idea of being able to bring wildlife into towns through stepping stones, wildlife corridors. And I think there's a whole new area of ecological restoration, which brings the, the countryside, not only, not only um, restores the rangelands, restores the forests, restores the, 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 the biologically rich areas, but actually brings this into the urban areas where most of the people live. And actually, if you like the clients, the people are ultimately going to fund the work into the future. Um, and so I think, again, this, this is a very important aspect of the work of the Arabian Plant Specialist Group, together with botanic gardens, such as the Kranich Botanic Garden, Qatar, where we can actually start um, telling people about really what we're doing. I mean, people probably aren't aware of the restoration programmes. People aren't aware of the red listing programmes that have been going on. They're not aware of a lot of these really important programmes. And I think we just need to get out there more and tell people what is really going on. And Dr. Dr. Jonas, yeah, I just wanted to say that that uh, I understand your your frustration, wanting to see you know action, wanting to see the data turn into activities and to mobilize. But also, you have to look at yourself. And uh, I mean, watching this webinar today, I see that there's a huge platform of expertise and knowledge and institutions and and uh, some people, you know that. Many regions of the world would, would uh, envy wanting to have this kind of infrastructure. So I think that you're a very 
very important step forward. And having convened and reactivated this group is a very positive sign. So I would just try to flip it around and, and, uh, and uh, say that you're very close to achieving what you, what, what the vision that you are proposing, Ahmed. And I think that uh, this is a really great effort uh, in that direction. Can I say something? Yes, please. Um, yes, yeah, so I, I want to say I also enjoyed very much um, the array of, of presentations today and, and they're very inspiring. And you can see that there's different hubs of expertise in the different countries um, which really would benefit from your planned um, sharing across across the different countries that are going to be involved in the, in the revived Arabian plant specialist group. Um, I, I think that maybe one thing that I'm missing from the proposal at the moment is, is one project that, that, that you can all lobby behind. So you have the red listing, which is one, but, but maybe really trying to get a complete network of IPAs, important plant areas across your region would be a really very good starting point. And, 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 and it mean that you have to get all your data organized to be able to do that. Um, you know, so, 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 so thinking about a project like that, where you just one simple goal that, that unites your efforts. And the, the fantastic thing about the important plant area criteria, um, which is not in the key biodiversity area criteria, is that it does include socioeconomically important plants, which for your region is so critical, given that you're the cent, you know, very important center for crop wild relatives and you have so many medicinal species, et cetera. So, so, so this is a really useful thing about the important plant areas. But I do want to, to think, get you also to think about the role of getting the plants conserved in the long term in your different countries. And what we've found, um, so I am based in South Africa, we, we have a Southern African plant specialist group that's been going for many years and, and we're working across the region. Um, and we found it's really important to help governments in their responsibilities to the CBD. And so we've decided to do key, key biodiversity areas also, um, as well as the important plant areas because, and making sure that the plant data go into that because that's where the countries have to report against in terms of the, the, the proposed post 2020 targets. So I think keeping an eye on what those post 2020 targets are and their indicators and there's a lot of indicators, there's indicators around crop wild relatives, et cetera. And if you go back and if you go and look at those now while you're planning your specific activities, I think it will really help to, for you to get your products taken up by your various governments to ensure that the actual places that you're identifying are important for plants, the places you want restoration to happen actually do happen. So, so by aligning to those, to those um, targets it will, will make a difference. So I think this is the moment, since your, your group is under formation at the moment and under, under reinstatement, it's a good moment to, to really try to decide just on one or two things that you can unite again uh, around um, and work on. And um, also make sure that your work is very usable by, by other government agencies. I mean, I see many government agencies are already involved here, but that it can be taken up into in, into the, the decision-making processes that happen at the at the, each na nation's level, I hope that's useful. Could I uh, could I just say say something quickly in response to that? I, I I take your point about the KBAs and the IPAs, but the way that we're working is we we intend IPAs to be able to feed directly into the KBA process. Um, we just find that the IPA is actually a much easier way for us to work with plants. And as you say, brings in socioeconomic issues. And, and, and it's, it, deals, it deals much better, I think, with habitats and vegetation types, which are really only briefly mentioned in the KBA approach. So I think to some extent, even though we're aware that reporting really has to be done using KBAs, we prefer to feed into KBAs via the API, IPA approach. Um, and I think there are, I mean, there are, there are IPA programs starting in, in, in a lot of countries now. So I think your, your, your suggestion there is a, is, a, is a really good one and a relatively easy one to take up. And I think an, a useful one for the Raven Plant Specialist Group, because we did discover when we're doing it in a country, you can't really do IPAs in one country without understanding what's going on in the surrounding countries. To be able to understand what a threatened vegetation type is, you need to know the extent of that vegetation type outside your country. 
So it is actually a really good forum, the Arabian Plant Specialist Group, where we could come up, for instance, with a list of threatened habitats within the region, an agreed, an agreed vegetation map within the region. These are all things that we don't really have at the moment and actually very difficult for then to be able to to be able to regionally decide, nationally decide what's the, what's regionally threatened, if you like, if that, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Uh, here, the four Mad baskets. Uh... Yes, Ms. Fatima. Hello. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you so much uh, for everyone. Um, I have just uh, listening to all the uh, presentations. Um, they are all excellent presentations and uh, we heard about and we understand in more details about the different uh, activities and programs um, are um, taking in, in actions in here in the region. I think uh, it's a good start for the group. And uh, it would be um, uh, very interesting to bring all this information and data together uh, and to analyze the real situation uh, in, in, the, in the region. Uh, what's the, what's the, um, the, the weakness? What's the uh, strong, uh, strong points that we have and different opportunities and the actions that have been taken and then how we can integrate it with the international um, uh, programs like the uh, global strategy and the post 2020. And then we can um, set our priorities for the short and for the long term uh, for the group and uh, also to build the communications and the network networking is very important uh, so we can have um, a very strong start and we can learn from and share the information and data from all uh, different uh, parties um, so I think uh, this is a very good uh, opportunity for all of us thank you very much uh, Ahmed for the, the, the webinar um, it's, it's very important and uh, very useful the webinar and thanks for all of you thank you dr thoraya for you. for your uh, for your all for all inputs for all the speakers on or for the organizers for the Remember specialist group for all the for all the members of the group which is uh, still uh, we hope inshallah to be uh, revived uh, very soon uh, with ssc I think uh, Dr. John and Dr. Dumitella and uh, Dr. Ehab, they have, uh, 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 yeah, yeah. there is a, uh, you see that the, the area need urgent for this kind of group. Uh, and we need to your support with SACP in order to, uh, to support this kind of group in order to, to link the, between all the conservation issues in the, in the region. Uh, I think here there is one an important uh, an issue for you, Dr. Thraya and Dr. Tony, they are they are asking about how the priorities of the of the group and uh, Kari, uh, from Thraya here, and she's asking how how you to be a member or something like this. Dr. Dr. Tony, sorry, I didn't quite catch the question. What's the question you want to know? I mean, I mean, uh, how to uh, to give the priorities for the Arabian Brain Specialist Group? and how people can can join this kind of group in the future well I, I i think the to some extent you know the priorities are are something that the membership of the group together with the speech and survival commission has to agree together if you like but it would this is why i'm quite keen i'd be quite keen to have some sort of questionnaire to try and gather information first to try and get an idea of what you know, I have my ideas, you have your ideas, everybody has their ideas what the priorities for the region should be, but perhaps try and get an idea from people listening to this programme and to this webinar and other, and other members of the Arabian Plot Specialty Group what their priorities are and then try and align those as we can with the SSC, Species Survival Commission priorities. I mean, that would be the way forward. I don't think it's really up to us now to say what the priorities are necessarily. You know, we do have to take into account the people you know, you know, if you like the membership. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. So inshallah, after, after, after the revival of the group, it will be such um, uh, like um, 
a criteria uh, and, and grouping for, for the people. I think, I think uh, after uh, we will have the, the survey, as Dr. Tony mentioned, that we will of the, uh, uh, of, of the scientist or, or the specialist inside the group. And after, from, from this point, we can categorize the people how, how to work together, uh, how to analyze all of this data, how, how to create a one platform that people can, uh, so the people can work together uh, for the region. So, uh, Ms. Fatima Al-Khulaifi, if you wanted to, to give a talk or, or a short sentence before we closing the session. Uh, well, uh, thank you, Ahmed, very much for this uh, webinar. Uh, you have worked uh, really hardly. I, will, uh, I would like to thank everybody uh, who participated in this uh, uh, webinar. Uh, it's very useful, actually, and uh, uh, it shows the, uh, the intention of everybody to, uh, to collaborate uh, uh, for the best of, of uh, the uh, veg vegetation of the uh, um, uh, Arabian Peninsula. Um, I would agree with all of you who, uh, who think that uh, uh, to do the database, actually, and this is, uh, is going to be a really valuable work, but the implementation for the, uh, for, uh, after collecting the, uh, the information or after doing the questionnaire or survey, the implementation is the most important uh, uh, step. Uh, for all of us, I think, not only for the uh, for for your group. Uh, uh, thank you, every uh, everybody, and uh, we in the Quranic Botanic Garden actually looking forward to work with all of you, either those uh, uh, who works in the IUCN or um, members in IUCN or the uh, other member uh, in uh, the Arabian Pen uh, Arabian Plants uh, Group. Uh, we would like to work with all of you uh, and do our own plan for the future, inshallah. Uh, thank you, everybody. Shukran jazeelan. Thank you, Ahmed. And thank you so much, uh, Ms. Fatima. Uh, thank, thanks for all. Do anybody need to add any? Uh, so uh, thank you so much for this, uh, uh, for your attendance, for your great inputs uh, for this to, to make this webinar real. Thank you, Ms. Fatima Al-Khulifi, Director of the Quran Botanic Garden, Dr. John Bull Rodriguez, Chair, ICN Species Survivor Commission, Dr. Uh, Dumitella uh, Rimando, Deputy Chair, ICN Species Survivor Commission, uh, Dr. Rehab Aid, the Vice Chair, ICN Species Survivor Commission, West Asia, uh, Dr. Thuraya Saeed, uh, Chairperson of the Arabian Blood Specialist Group, uh, Dr. Tony Miller, the Vice Chairperson of the Arabian Blood Specialist Group, and one of the unique experts of the Royal Botanic Garden, uh, Edinburgh, uh, Dr. Hatem Taifur, a botanist, uh, is a uh, plant expert, uh, uh, genetic expert on the Oman Animal and Plant Genetic Resource Center. Uh, Dr. Shahina Olomfar, uh, Honorary Research Associate and Editor of the Flora of Iraq, uh, Royal Botanic Garden Q. Uh, Dr. Sophie Nil, the head of the Center for Middle Eastern Plants. The plant expert, uh, Department of Agriculture, uh, Minister of Municipality and Environment, Qatar, and uh, accept all of my thanks, uh, Ahmed Al-Gharib, Assistant Researcher, the Quranic Botanic Garden and the Vice Chairperson of the Arabian Plant Specialist Group. Thank you uh, for all attending. Thank you for all the people who are attending this webinar. And inshallah, looking to see you in the coming or in the near future. Thank you so much. Shukran. Thank you. Shukran, uh, Ahmed. Assalamu alaikum.